Hello, everybody. This is Pete Morris. This is the Comanche Zoom for April Fool's Day, April 1, 2021. And uh, just to give an idea of what we're talking about, here's the, uh, the hit list for tonight. Uh, whole mess of things that the Northeast Comanche Tribe is working on, hot irons in the fire. As you can see, there's quite a list that we're going to go down. And uh, we got a bunch of different people that are coming in to do to talk about the various ones. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be kind of a free for all, but we'll go for it anyhow. And so now we're back to the normal who you are, where you are, and what you fly, and anything else you want to talk about. Go for it. So, Michael Saperton, I'm from Deer Valley, uh, Phoenix, and I have a Comanche PA24250, 1963 vintage. And um, I just love her. It's, a, it's an awesome bird, and I went flying yesterday and the day before, and just just for the fun of it. So I have a tip for you guys. You know, you can leave yourself muted, and if you touch your space bar, it unmutes you, kind of like a push to talk button, just for fun. Want to try it? Hello. Look at that. Isn't that the coolest thing. So hey, you're right. You can stay muted, and only uh, unmute yourself when you're pushing your space bar. If it works for the host, that only works. It only works if you have a space bar. Things like iPads and iPhones don't have space bars. Yeah, that is true. You still have to hit the old mute button. Oh, actually, you know what? On, on, a mobile, on a mobile device, if you swipe to the, I think to the left, all the way, it says um, it, it goes into drive mode. Especially if you're on like a, a cell phone. I don't know about on an iPad. I'll have to experiment with that. But it, there's a push to talk button there too. Drive and talk. Anyway, so yeah, so let, let's talk more about this exhaust leak. Is this something I'm going to just have a problem with on the ground? And it's, it's the electronics carbon monoxide sensor is just getting my gander up unnecessarily. You're going to get uh, exhaust flowing through from the uh, exhaust, it flows into the into the uh, landing gear wells, and then those are porous into the wing, and the wing is porous into the cabin. Okay, so great. I think I, they, if I rem you you should ask Cliff, uh, but Cliff, if I remember correctly, what he said, it's not something that you can do anything about on the ground. It's simply going to happen because the cabin is not airtight. And that once you're, as soon as you take off, uh, it's going to go away. Yeah, and that's that's basically what happened. You know, I, I've never had a problem with carbon monoxide before, and it's just like, but to exacerbate it is to have that fuel smell when after you land, and it's like, oh my god. Between that and the fuel smell after you land is an indication that your um, fuel bladders are leaking, uh, and they're yeah. seeping a little bit into the wing. You don't smell it in flight; you smell it during the landing flare. Yeah, when, you, when you're landing and you slosh them around a little bit, they splash up toward the top. Usually if there's a hole in the fuel cells, it is up near the filler port. Oh, really? So that's, you know, when the fuel gets sloshed around, it finds those little holes and then you smell it. Well, yeah, maybe it's that, but uh, that's, you'll, it'll find the holes if, it's, if you top off the tanks and you have little perforations in the eight in the top of the bladders due to the age of the bladders but uh the other thing is that you you get it during the landing flare because the high pressure you put the gear down and then you raise the angle of attack during the flare and you get higher pressure in the landing gear wells which pushes air up into the wings which brings that vaporized fuel that's in the wings anyway but brings it into the cabin Wow, so you get that well-known Comanche yeah. situation of suddenly having the cabin smell like av gas during the landing flare. It means you're doing the landing flare right, but it also means you've got some leakage in, in your wings from your planet. Yeah, I, I signed up for Angel Flight and I've had, you know, just a number of uncomfortable, like the smell, I don't know how well that would go off on a, on a patient being traveled from location to location. So I had kind of... Uh, I've kind of backed off from offering my services. All the Angel Flight and PALS patients who I've transported, uh, not a one of them has complained about it. They were happy to get where they were going quickly and safely, and, and they didn't mind the brief uh, 
Angel are you in, are you in, are you with Angel Flight as well, Malcolm? I started with Angel Flight, and then after a few years, I switched to Pals. Same with me. I'm I'm doing Angel Flights also, and and again, they are overly greatly in favor of the flights. No complaints. Okay, great. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back in the game then. You know who else doesn't complain about the fuel smell when you're giving them a ride is uh, puppy rescues. And we love puppies. All right, so uh, jump in for this quiet spot, who you are, where you are, once you fly. I'm Tracy, I'm in Fort Worth and I fly anything I can get my hands on. <laughs> This is Ray Fay from Madison, Wisconsin. I fly a 260B model. Oh, and Catherine Wood, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, at some point, I'll finally get to fly my Comanche 9090 Papa. Oh, and congratulations. Does this mean that, that Garmin's done with test flying for the no. GFC 500? No, the, the picture is from when it was leaving to go uh get the uh maintenance work done just getting had a convenient place to take a picture also also flying it well welcome and thank you for letting your airplane be used for something that's that important to all of us well you know there, there are some self-serving reasons where it's nice to have that happen too always but nonetheless that was the big thing every person that wanted to get an autopilot certified for a Comanche had to find some generous owner willing to let their airplane be down for quite a while so that they could get the uh, certification work done. So, um, you know, the 400 that supported the Aztec, yours that supported the Garmin GFC 500, Sean Cassius supported the Trio Pro Pilot along with Marty Niesk, uh, Marty uh, Hench. So uh, just a quick shout out and recognition. Uh, thanks, Owen. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, you know, I was down for maintenance for a year and a half, your maintenance and upgrades for a year and a half plus another six months. <laughs> oh, there are those of us who are like, we resemble that remark. You are not alone. Well, welcome and thanks again. And everybody jump in as Pete Moore said, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. And welcome to the Comanche Zoom. Jim Brown, presently in Yuma, Arizona, going back to Canada in the next two weeks. Jim, you're back and forth to Canada. The borders are becoming porous again. Hallelujah. <laughs> Absolutely. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Jim. Thanks for being here. Thanks, AJ. <laughs> yeah. Who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Hi, everybody. I'm Troy Watson. I live at Tango 5-6, just south of the W Metroplex and I fly a Comanche T50. Troy, that is a beautiful photo. Welcome and thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks, yeah. That was on the, that's well on the trip home from uh, Clifton Arrow. Oh, awesome. You have a good photographer. I think we need to organize some fly-ins just so people can get shots like that for each other, carefully, safely. Everybody jump in any quiet moment. Who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Bernie James, Jackson Valley, California, that's 260. Still in getting them about every year I need. Bernie, gorgeous shot. Welcome and thanks for being here. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Bill Kniff. <clears throat> Joining up for the evening, looking for another wonderful session. Bill Kniff, welcome and thank you for joining us. I uh, just want to give you an extra shout out for the work you're doing to get neighborhoods together of Comanches and building the Comanche spirit. Thanks for your service. I'm having fun. Best kind. Thanks. Everybody jump in. Hey guys, Ryan Jeffrey in Holland, Manitoba, Canada up here. Uh, good day today. Just picked up the Comanche from annual. Everything's good. Ready to go flying. The best day else. is, <laughs> it's the best and worst day. That's the day you pay the bill and get to do your giant post-annual pre-flight. You've got a yeah. Comanche Zoom upcoming on that exact topic by George Richmond. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that because as we all know, 
uh, right after they're supposedly fixed everything is your most likely time that things will break. <laughs> well, yeah. welcome and congratulations. My bill's in the mail, so I haven't seen the damage yet. Good. <laughs> Just be happy <laughs> yeah. until it comes. Well, welcome. I see Alan Cheek. Welcome, Alan. Hey, CJ. Good evening. Uh, Alan Cheek, Peachtree City, uh, 63 Comanche 250. Good to see you, and thanks for being with us. And I will be and, at uh, CC. Thanks. We'll have a good briefing for Comanche Town shortly. Don Pitts. I have a 1966-260B, Lovington, New Mexico. Don, it's an honor to have you here with us today. And uh, that is a great year and model. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Pat Donovan. I have a 64180 just northwest of St. Louis. One of the last and best of the 180s ever made. Good to have you, Pat. Thanks for joining us. Well, if you're going to be this shy, I'm going to start recognizing y'all. <laughs> Jack... I'm Bernie Stumpf, if I may interrupt you. <laughs> and? Uh, I'm planning to fly to New Bern, North Carolina on April 12th on my way to Sun and Fun the next day. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, whether or not I, I'm going to have a co-pilot on this trip or not. You are. Good. Possibly are. two co-pilots, right, Phil? Is that an welcome? What's the question? You, you, you're, you're welcome. That, are you offering a seat in your airplane? <clears throat> Uh, there actually are, I think, six people coming down from New York, or maybe seven now, from uh, the general area. And yours is currently time. holding a spot, but there are several people who might be able to fly share and might welcome an experienced CFLI like, like you. Unfortunately, I only get two days off, just <laughs> Wednesday and Thursday, just the 14th and 15th. I have to work all day on, on Tuesday yeah. and Friday. Right, I, I heard Florida had limits. You want to sit here? I don't care. I just. Why don't I sit over there and you sit over here? Okay. Bernie, you've got an open mic. Yeah. Okay. And Bernie, I got. Um, say again about you heard Florida. Yeah, I just heard Florida had a limit on how many Yankees they allow in at one time. <laughs> We're planning to go in incommunicado. They take everyone they can get. If you've got a wallet and it's not empty, you are welcome in Florida. That's what I think. <laughs> well, that's the, uh, no doubt, no doubt. Um, everybody who's looking to fly share, um, coordinate, uh, just send a note to the organizers. We do keep a list and those who have offered seats, um, especially Malcolm, if you've only got two days and a ride down or up, plus your uh, commercial privileges could help. We can, we may be able to help. And Tracy, good to see you. We want to let us know where you are and what you fly. Oh, I already did that. Where were you? Oh, you weren't there. No, I'm in <laughs> Fort Worth, and that that is what I used to fly. And now I fly anything I can get my hands on when somebody's nice enough to let me or take me or whatever. <laughs> gotcha. And I uh, just want to quickly, uh, that's Tracy Ligon. He the is going to be presenting. <laughs> Sorry, Troy. Um, Tracy will be our presenter uh, next week, and Tracy is an aircraft appraiser. So everybody who's been wondering why that cool new avionics package you just put in uh, didn't make your airplane double in price, given that you doubled the amount you had just invested into your Comanche, <laughs> Tracy may have some answers. So join us next week to hear Tracy on aircraft appraisal. He's a very experienced Comanche guy as well and a real professional. 
uh, with a lot of integrity. So Tracy, we're thrilled that we're going to be hearing from you. Oh, well, I hope you are after next week. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I have no doubt be, we will be. <laughs> there may be some people wanting to throw rocks at me after that. I don't know, but uh, reality, you. reality is reality, you know? Reality bites, and I'm sure we'll be throwing rocks at our screen. That's why we have Zoom. It's for your protection. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, Troy, I did hear you were down just south of DFW. I, I, that airplane was out at Spinks when I took that picture. Um, I live in Tango 5-6 over by Midway. Yeah, I used to keep that out at Midway, too. So I, I'm familiar with that territory. Good evening. This is George. I didn't catch. George, welcome. Didn't catch the rest. No rest. I'm, I'm with the meeting. That's all. Good. Uh, where are you? Savannah, Georgia, where it's sunny and beautiful. Is it windy it's, down there? Not especially, no. Okay. Cold. Good deal. Cold is it's barely the mid 60s. It's, it's awful cold. <laughs> 19 is what we're going to have here. So, uh, yeah. I forgot. I forgot. I, I apologize to all. <laughs> Rub it okay. in. It, it's uh, four four seventeen here, and it's uh, ninety five degrees outside my backyard. Holy smoke! Yeah, it's going to be a hot summer. Looking forward to getting out of here. <laughs> it's severe VFR here. Airplane performs like never before. Way Just to go. About 60 degrees and sea level, you're not going to be more normal than that. That's it. I was just doing tire pressures. Is uh, for a Comanche 260, 45 and everything about right? It's in your manual. Um, there was a top 10 tips for new Comanche owners because the different Comanches have different tire pressures. And uh, I think it was Pete Morse who suggested writing the uh, actual tire pressure on the inside of your landing gear uh, flap. flap so that uh, you always have it right there for you. It's roughly 45, 45, 27 on the nose wheel. Uh -huh. That's a 250, yep. Sounds right to me. Good deal. I thought I remembered reading somewhere, and I can't put my finger on it again, but if you had a three-blade prop and six-ply tires, they said 42 all the way around. But like I said, I can't find that literature. So I'm 42 and 30 in the nose now. So anybody know about that? I heard the same thing. Ryan, I'm 42 all the way around. Well, where'd you guys find that? Like I said, I can't. Bible knowledge. Since. No, it's <laughs> actually, if I recall, it's in the, uh, is it in the pilot's operating handbook? No, uh, it should be in the supplement with the three-bladed prop to make that change. Maybe, yeah. Uh... Cool. Well, I don't have the original pilot's handbook. I have the one from uh, ICS. Oh, you can't use those things because they're too new and too right. <laughs> you got to use the old one that was wrong. <laughs> Actually, here's what's really interesting. It turns out that... Um, so. Doug Killo did those and um, they were a fantastic improvement in that they used sort of the conventional format and added a whole bunch of other um, information. And although it was public domain, he pulled it together. However, there were a few odd things that happened when you adopted that manual. If you flew a two tank Comanche, they mistakenly said that you have uh, 28 gallons usable. And that may not be Doug. It may be that Piper did that in order. No, I, my mistake. It was Piper 
that did that in order to add the ox tanks. But in fact, you actually, if you have a two tank mansion, you have 30 gallons usable. Not that your fuel planning should be down to two gallons, but- 60 uh, gallons usable. Yep. And uh, the twin Comanches were actually certified for flight into icing if they had the boots, the wet props, I think it is, and the heater plate on the windshield so you, so you could see. Uh, and, if, and the kilo manuals, if you are depending on that, uh, prohibit that. So if you happen to have an, an, an equipped twin Comanche and you don't write something like, you know, for reference only, uh, you could be losing your ability one of the abilities that your airplane has so it's it's uh it's due for an update and that is coming and everybody just uh jump in say who you are where you are and what you fly we are a friendly group bill ryan so mitchellville maryland four five papa Miller, welcome. And I owe you and Josh an intro, I apologize. Because so Miller and Josh both are married to astronauts. Yeah. It's very cool. <laughs> it's one of the things that makes us Comanches extra cool is we have people like Miller Einzel and Josh Benson. <laughs> Well, welcome and thanks for being here with us. And everybody jump into any quiet moment, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Uh, Serge just uh, put in that the tire pressure on the 400, and he's in the chat window. Thank you, Serge. Is uh, 27 PSI all around. Really? All around? <laughs> What? I don't know that I'd buy that statement. Yeah. <laughs> Serge, do you want to, is it really definitely all around 27? Everybody's asking because the 400 is heavier than the others. I'm just looking at the service manual now that I have on the internet on online. Perfect. And on in section one, they're talking about the nose and main gear is 27 PSI. So. There it is. And are you six ply tires on the 400? Uh, the two six, the, the 180s are four ply, so they have a slower tire, a, a different tire pressure. And then the uh, yeah, the, yeah, the R2 R2 R2. They are six ply. Yeah, and I think your six ply all around. And if I recall, the 250s and 260s are they six on the mains and four ply on the nose? I I'm that. using Michelin Condor six plies, all three wheels. Uh, and a hello to, yep, and a hello. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. And a hello to Pat Kiefer, who said that her background's a little noisy to open the mic. So thanks. And Pat's flying a uh, beautiful twin that's been all the way around the world from Texas. Is that right, Pat? Hopefully. Sorry, guys. I'm just. <laughs> gonna step, I'm going to step in. I'm looking back on it again, and I'm in the wrong category. The 180 is 27 psi. Good. The 250 is. 27 for the nose and 42 for the mains. The 260 is 27 nose, 42 for the mains, as well as the, no, sorry, the 400 is 42 all around. Sarah, that, that sounds better. That all sounds right. Well I like just, it. we need to have a gold star award, and I think Sarah just won it because that was great <laughs> info. Thank you. And it also tells you where to find it. And the service manual is one of the things that we're actually going to be talking about at this Zoom, which is that these are now, thanks to Matthew Smith, all available online. And um, we'll be getting into that later. I'll tell you where to find them. We got about four minutes or so till we get to the presentation. <laughs> yep. That's a good point. Pat's mentioning their twins actually been around the world twice and beat all the other airplanes it was racing against. <laughs> Pretty cool. Hello, everybody. I'm Pat Lee. I fly at 260, and I'm over here in Minnesota. Pat, 
I am so glad to have you because you and I have PJ, I can't remember if he was able to make it tonight. And I'm going to ask you to just quickly jump in when we talk fly-ins because of the one that you are going to be making happen. Hey, there you go. Yes. All right. We're looking forward to it. Same. Hank Spellman at KAAA in the dead center of the Illinois cornfields. Uh, 5903 Papa in 1959, Comanche 250. Good to see you, Paint, Hank, and uh, thanks for being part of us. Hiya, Mike Meadows down in uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, that twin Comanche behind my uh, head, whatever side that is. <laughs> <laughs> that gorgeous twin Comanche. Mike, it is great to have you with us this evening. Thanks for joining. How many folks are going to Sun and Fun? Oh, that would be telling. Um, so we have 55 registered with more coming in and Pat will be talking about that more tonight. Cool. I'll be there. Outstanding. John Futter, Orange Mass, 260C, 9317 Pop. Hello, all. Hello. <laughs> John, welcome. Thanks for being with us. Got about another three minutes till the action starts. Yeah, I'll just, I'll throw a quickie out here just for the folks that are going down to Sun and Fun. Um, since there obviously seems to be a lot of us, but you know, if I could make a suggestion, I mean, somehow for everybody, I mean, write your name on a piece of duct tape or something and put it on your shirt. But um, <laughs> it's just, it's nice to sit there and be able to go, hey, uh, Hey, Alan, how you doing? You know, or instead of, hey, you. So I don't know, just throwing that out there. Uh, nothing formal, but just somehow somebody can read your name. And, and then all of a sudden, if you're in a, uh, you know, if you're in a conversation with five other Comanche guys, what I like to call the campfire uh, or whatever, but, you know, you can sit there and call a man by or a woman by his first name. So food for thought. You know, uh, Alan, not only are you right, but our first inaugural uh, Comanche town, which was at Oshkosh in 2018, which was our, we were like, we have to have a birthday party for our type. And uh, we got a, just a big package of labels, the hello, my name is. And then we handed out a bunch of those and a bunch of pens and everybody started labeling their neighbors. It was a little tacky, but it was a great way to get to know everybody. And we had 80 something people for gumbo and uh, we were all wearing labels. Nice, yeah. Uh, You're right on. Okay. Hi, this is John again. Can we uh, do something about this for the Northeast <laughs> Tribe at some point? Forget that little, I'm sorry, Timmy. <laughs> can we do that? I've got one of those too, even though I've been kicked out. <laughs> yeah, I have one of those too. <laughs> I swear I need a name tag to tell who I am. <laughs> That's a great idea. John, you know your friend who was very, very, very ill with COVID but is recovering? Yes. Is he able to make those? I don't believe he does. I can try to check around and see if you know somebody that does. I can look into you that if you like. I love that. And the other thing I think we should look into is how many people, and if you can have pipe into the chat window, how many people would like an official um, Comanche jacket with your airplane's number and your name on it? I do. Like a Michael Saperton, I'm in. <clears throat> and I may be able to do something about the name tags for Comanche Town, even though I may not be able to attend. I do have a friend of mine who has a printing business who uh, makes labels and plaques and all kinds of stuff. Michael, you, so you just rock. need to send me a list of names and airplane end numbers and things like that and where you're from and 
I need to get an estimate from him, but do it quickly. All about it. What's that? I can send you the file of who's coming. Really? That would be great. And That's I'll send it to Jim Mapstead, my buddy, who will give me yep. a, a deal on these things. Um, Pat, do you think, um, let me just ask Pat Donovan, because there's not just the people who are flying in, but lots of people who are driving in that have Comanches or people with Comanches that are flying in with other people that have Comanches. Um, so it's actually quite a big list, but let's, uh, let's see what we can do. And then we're, and we'll bring that up on the Facebook marketplace. I mean, not the Facebook, the uh, Northeast, uh, the marketplace thing that we're creating. Cool. Uh, name tags is a really good idea, CJ. Yep. I'm psyched. <laughs> I just wrote Michael's name down next to labels and name tags for Comanche Town and other places. Yeah. You know, the little Michael. stickers from Office Max or, or a Walmart work a really well, too. <laughs> you know what, <laughs> Alan? That'll be perfect for out, uh, this time because uh, we're not going to have much time to do anything else, really. Yeah. I was going to say, the simplest thing is just go pick a, pick them up out of Office Depot or, I mean, I'll pick yeah. up a box or two or whatever out of Walmart, wherever you get those things. My wife was a court reporter. Office she, Depot, yeah, Staples up there still. Yeah, any of those things and just say, get a button. Yeah, I'll pick up a box or two. <laughs> Let me, oh, let, me awesome. call, let me call my buddy Jim right now and see how quickly he can make name tags up. And how many do you think there are? About 25 or 30? No, I'm guessing we may have more like in 50 to 80 that are going to request and be willing to, to pay something for it. Yep. Oh, okay. And if oh, no, it's not. Have, what do you hey. think is standard? Um, what, what's the measurement on the ICS? I don't know if I have my... my credit card. card. What's that? That's the credit card. Oh, you want the same size as a credit card? That's about the same. No, I think yeah. it's a little smaller than that. Yeah. Credit yeah. card. A uh, credit card, like a business card, maybe? Yeah. This size? Yeah. Oh, okay. Agree. Yeah. Okay. Two by three. And, Sorry, my uh, my my key is not working. There you go. Yep. And yep. James has had his hand up. I want to just uh, recognize James. Yeah, Michael, I've seen both uh, half credit card sized and credit card sized. And we'll get you a logo. I just wanted to see CJ that I would love to buy a jacket. Okay. Yeah. We will look into that. Hey, John, John Futter, can you put that back up again? Two by three. Oh, it's two by three? Yep. Let me see it. John Futter, can you hold it up to the camera again? There you go. Remember, we have old eyes. We need a larger. <laughs> and John, just talk while you're uh, holding it up. It'll give yep. you precedence. It it is two by three. Now these are, you know, they're they're more than labels or whatever. They're plastic. They're I don't know. They're engraved. However, um, and these had I think a point slip or or pins on the back. So, so I, I'm not able to go to Sun and Fun, but I would be interested in one for, for future fly-ins, certainly. Cool. And Don Pitts just saw your message that you're interested as well. Uh, we'll collect these from the chat window and feel free to just throw them in for everybody. We can spam, <laughs> spam all of us. There's three uh, normally used uh, mounting a pin, a clip, or a magnet. So you got to choose what kind you want. Go the magnet; it's better. Yeah, I, I agree. But not everybody likes those. But the, the pen destroys clothing that you might not want to have uh, a permanent hole in. Uh, the clamp is inconvenient, but it, it doesn't do any damage. Magnets, you lose the back, you're done. Good deal. Yes, but it falls into your waist, so you're okay. Uh, good for you. Mine falls on top of my belly. <laughs> <laughs> and if you happen to have a uh, name tag from some other organization, like an EA chapter or something like that, feel free to bring and wear that. Cool. Good idea. All right, we will try to get uh, name tags and uh, jackets up on the marketplace and uh, 
and separately, just because we're going to be trying to go really fast. Um, Michael, we'll see how quickly we can move to see if we can get things in for Sun and Fun. Okay. And uh, so offline, we'll coordinate and get Pat Donovan, Pete Morse, myself, and Michael Saperton, Saperton together on the labels. Is that that good for everybody? We're into that 7.30 thing, so I want to get this thing started for the recording purposes. Uh, again, I'm going to mute everybody just for temporarily and uh, show the, uh, the Zoom thing that we're going to be talking about just for information. This is the, the list that we're going to have. In fact, we may even leave it up while people are talking. And most of the talking is going to be done by CJ. She's going to hand it off to various people as we go along. So here we go. I would suggest that you all go to a, uh, a speaker view on your, your choices for the visual. The other way you get to see who's talking. Okay, unmute and go for it. So I'm CJ Stump. Um, I fly a 260B, which is my father's, and a uh, 180, um, which I'm taking care of for a Marine stationed overseas. And I really, it's a great pleasure to introduce Patrick Donovan. Um, Pat Donovan is well known as a Comanche driver for more than 25 years, an absolutely um, committed volunteer for all things Comanche, former ICS president, the person who got us all parking together in the first place. Comanche Town wouldn't have happened without him and a few other people. So Pat, you want to tell us how Comanche Town's going and how to get registered and what we need to do to be good with Sun and Fun as well? Okay. Um... Can I be made a co-host for a minute, please, uh, Pete? Um, right now, I'm showing 53 people that have signed up for Comanche Town, meaning 53 people are planning to fly in their Comanche. Now, at this point in time, only uh, 44 is the maximum we're going to have at any one time, but um, it's going to be busy. Uh, we are not expecting to be able to fit any more in right now, but we know that there will be some weather or mechanical issues that would prevent um, everybody from showing up. So if you want to be on a wait list or you want to call me before you come in, to find out whether or not there's space, we'd be happy to have you. I know that uh, we're gonna end up having to tail a few people and stack some in the aisles if we have everyone there that we're expecting to. Um, you should already have the address, uh, or the web address to go to Northeast Comanche to register as far as Comanche Town is concerned. Now, don't forget that does not include camping fees uh, if you're choosing to camp, as well as wristbands for Sun and Fun proper. If you're only parking, you're not camping, by all means, uh, uh, come on in and park with us, but there is no fee for just parking, only for camping. And that's all I can, oh, well, no, wait a minute. We're gonna have a bunch of seminars there. There will be a tent uh, like there was two years ago. Um, and we hope to publish the list of seminars um, that will run at 10 and 11 o'clock in the morning. And everyone of course is welcome to come. I hope we're going to have enough uh, water. Uh, we will have generator running if you need to recharge electronics. Um, that's all I can think of at the moment. We will publish the seminar list in the next couple of days. I will be mailing out, that is emailing out, the required placard to get into Sun and Fun uh, probably tomorrow. Um, into Sun and Fun, I mean, into Comanche Town. So if, if you're flying a Comanche and you don't have that placard, you'll go with the regular vintage aircraft. 
that's all I've got. CJ, anything you want to add? Uh, let's see. That is fantastic. Um, one thing, um, if so, we may end up with a wait list because uh, you're still very welcome to register. And we had a few people that thought they had registered or that said, I'm going on uh, like Facebook. Um, as Pat said, always there are people who have a last minute, you know, avionics upgrade that doesn't finish or runs run into weather or something. And so we do expect that if you come in and we're like not sure we can accommodate you and commit to a spot now, they usually do open up. And uh, the peak days are Wednesday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to let you know, go ahead and register even if it says we're full and we'll do our best to fit people in. Pat, the emailing of the placards tomorrow, right now we're going to email them to everybody, right? And just tail people in or stake them down in the aisles. Well, we're going to email them to all the people that I have registered to come, yes. Exactly, yep. Um, so if you, uh, if you register after this, then uh, at what point are we going to, or can we just continue to email these placards? I mean, I'm trying, we're trying to say, how does it work if, if people who are like, oh my goodness, I need to finish registering and I'm coming. How do I get into Comanche Town? Well, um, once they register with Northeast that they're coming, I will get an update and I will email the appropriate information and placard. And oh, by the way, everyone, I know it goes without saying, but don't forget to carry the notum with you. And how do people uh, get their sun and fun wristbands? Because I know we can get them online or we can get them when we get there. It's not, yeah. like, uh, not like Oshkosh. Well, actually this year it is gonna be like Oshkosh. Uh, yes, you can get them, you can pay for it online, but you have to pick it up once you get there uh, at Sun and Fun, or you can pay for it at Sun and Fun once you get there. In the case of Oshkosh this summer, they're talking about actually mailing folks out um, the required information and wristbands uh, so that people don't have to stand in line and they can appropriately socially distance. Uh, Sun and Fun is not going to do that. Great. And um, Zach had mentioned that uh, Sun and Fun has places all around that you can get your wristbands. Uh, our location, uh, we expect to have one that's literally just on the other side of a drainage ditch um, that's at the end of our area for Comanche. So uh, you can get it online or you can just land taxi into Comanche town and walk around the corner and buy your wristband. Very easy. Uh, the only thing I have to add is um, that a very cool thing has happened. So there's an announcement that's gonna be happening at Comanche Town at Sun and Fun. And I'm just gonna tantalize you all to be there. And then Zach Grant and Hans Newbert will both be there talking about speed mods. You can all say, ooh. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Pat. That is fantastic. Does anybody have any questions before we move on to our next topic, which is fly-ins with Pete Morris? Well, let me introduce Pete Morse because Pete Morse has probably organized more fly-ins than anybody else I've ever met for Comanches um, and um, manages the fact that sometimes we'll have 50 or 60 people. Now, if you wanna really piss off a restaurant, show up unannounced with 50 or 60 uh, hungry pilots. Um, he has done a masterful job of locating great locations, um, sprinkling weekend events in amongst, uh, you know, easy to get to luncheons and is the Northeast Comanche Tribes webmaster as well as just a really, really helpful person. Pete, talk to us about fly-ins. This is the, uh, the Northeast Comanche Tribe home webpage. And right here is the fly-in schedule. These are the ones we're planning, which is the same as last year, but we did make a couple of checks. The reason it's the same is that we didn't get to do last year. They all got canceled. The next one coming up like here is, is uh, Delaware Coastal in uh, Georgetown, Delaware. That's uh, at the end of this month. So on the way back from, oh, it takes an extra week or so, but on the way back from Sunday Fun, you can stop by. I wanted to point out a couple of interesting ones though. We have, uh, 
here at Parlin Field on, in June on the 19th. On the 17th, I think it's a Thursday, uh, is a Zoom being done by George Merriman on a maximum effort takeoff and landing with your Comanche, how to do it. And what we're going to do at Parliament is do maximum takeoffs and landings on their relatively short field. And we will have people out there to measure how long it took you to get off the ground and how many feet it took you to stop, just for a challenge. So that's gonna be an interesting way of applying what you learned on the Thursday Zoom. Another one that's gonna be interesting is down below here at Warrington Parkway in Warrington, uh, Virginia, we're going to the Flying Circus. They only perform on Sundays and they fly around and do all kinds of crazy things with spearmen and their extras and stuff like that. But we're gonna go there and have a fun time eating the food at Fifi's uh, food bar at, uh, at the Warren Parkway, well, at Highway is, the, is the, uh, the airport itself. In the fly-in schedule also, these red ones are the things that are not normal fly-ins. The ICS convention still hasn't been set, set for next year. There's a Windjammer cruise that we're sponsoring uh, in Rockland, Maine on August two, 2 through 7. And the Oshkosh is mentioned here and Sun and Fun is mentioned up here. Uh, there is also a way of signing up for these things, but all kinds of stuff and other destinations. We have all this list of people, of places that we have been past and are, are recommending. And we broke it down by areas. So the Southeast and military, I mean, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, New York, New York, Pennsylvania, and New England areas. We also have a, a list of, uh, yeah, I can find it. Gotta go back. Uh, descriptions. There's a whole list of descriptions of the different ones to tell about the individual things that are going on, describing them uh, verbally for the thing. For instance, here's the uh, Newport, New Hampshire. It, this is the one at Parlin uh, and what's gonna happen there. Uh, here's uh, LAL for the, the uh, Sun and Fun. Here's Georgetown. And further down here, we have the Flying Circus. Here we go. I keep, I, I'm sorry for those that are dyslexic. This is the one for the, the Flying Circus and Balloon Festival. Uh, there is a cost for this one to go in, but it's definitely worth it as a family thing. We're trying to very much to do family things with our fly-ins. And that's, uh, that's pretty much what's going on with the fly-ins. Any questions? Pete, do you want uh, uh, things going on in the rest of the country? and Canada? I would be very happy to put them in here. I will put them in as like the red ones. I'll put them in probably a different color because they're not in the Northeast area, but definitely, yeah. Anything you, that, uh, you, you want to publicize, we could, we could be the, uh, the holder of the information. No sweat. I think Northeast is trying to expand its area beyond what is traditionally Northeast. We are not expanding our area. We are extending our help. Okay. Make it a, that's a, it's a difference. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you want to talk uh, fly-ins anywhere, I'd be happy to help you with your planning. I did it for a while for the Mid-States Drive uh, with Sarah McCauley, and uh, we had a, a great success getting stuff going there. I did a few, uh, helped for a few uh, down in Texas also uh, with uh, Bruce Thuman and uh, a couple other people down there. So, you know, it, it's a, it's a great, it, it's a, a very much a worthwhile thing to, to do that kind of stuff. In fact, on the, uh, if you look on the, the website, uh, see fun document, this is one here, right here. There's a thing on how to plan a fly-in right on the website. All the, all the steps that you need to go through, all the things you need to think about when you're planning to do a fly-in. And actually, step. yep. And I'll just want to jump in for a second. So um, the Northeast has always had a membership from all over. And uh, it's just always been the case that people belonged, you know, th this is back, oops, back, back when the ICS was still the ICS, uh, people belonged to multiple organizations or none. 
And uh, that's just kind of the way it's always been. The regional focus is no longer um, as much of an uh, of a thing because circumstances have changed. But everybody's always been welcome. Everybody's always been here. Uh, the fact that it used to be very regional is changing. Um, Pete, do you want to show the fly-in registration form? Because that is such an important thing. It was it it was adapted to support Comanche Town um, very successfully, as you know, many people have signed up. And then I want to get into some of the other fly-ins that are starting to happen around the U.S. and around the world. All right, here's the link right here on the fly-in page. And this is the form itself. The information that you're putting in is your name, hometown, email, whether or not you're flying in, tail number, home field, stuff like that, how many people on board, any comments you might have, chance to add yourself to the website. If you have room to share the flight, you have choices here. If, you're, if they're gonna share the flight, it's a good idea to put in a generic flight path that you're gonna take. And then you hit send, it comes to me. When you're choosing the fly-in, this is a drop-down. So right now, uh, LIL was the, is the one that's on there, that's for the Comanche town. The next one is going to be, well, Martinsfield was canceled. We decided not to do it because of COVID. Then it'll be uh, Sun and Fun, Georgetown in April, Ellenville in May, June, July, right on down. Uh, this is a special one. The, the asterisk means that, oops, I'm sorry about that. The asterisk means that it's on Sunday. And the same thing with the Trobe. This is, they only fly on Sunday for the Flying Circus and the Trobe has a buffet on Sunday. So we're choosing to go use uh, Saturday for the, the uh, possible rain date. And that's the form we use for that. If we go to back here to the New England forms, uh, somewhere here, oh, here it is. This is the one for Sun and Fun. Very similar idea, names, where you're from, email, contact information. Uh, it details about your arrival at, at Lakeland and whether or not you're camping or hoteling and any comments you want to put in. So it's the same kind of idea, but it, it's very easy to fill it out. <laughs> it's not easy to deal with it when I get it, but that's all right. I can handle that. And I get the word to uh, Pat, we're all set to go. This is why we love, well, you know, and love you, Pete. Um, the only uh, other thing is, uh, so I wanted to just qu quickly touch on some of what's starting to happen around the country because there is a, and the world, because there's quite a lot going on. Um, Pat Lee, do you want to talk a little bit about your second generation Comancheness and your hangar and uh, what's going to be happening in Minnesota? Okay, sure. Um, we're, we're thinking about having one here at Osceola and uh, we're trying to figure out what day and um, when it would be a good time to do it. I think um, it's a, a nice little airport. Uh, we have a 260 um, and uh, it'd be a nice nice little area to get a few people in and come out. There's a, a town right next door to the uh, airport and uh, hopefully they'll have the train rides running. Um, there's some trains that they can ride on. Uh, it's a nice little town that's restaurants, uh, hotels and um, and it's right along the riverside. So they got the river that's right there. And uh, it's a nice, nice little area. Okay. Whoop. I think I lost you there. <laughs> yes, sir. Whoop. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, there we go. Now I got you. <laughs> All right. Cool. Yes. And Pat, thanks. And part of what intrigued me was when you mentioned you had a heated, insulated hangar and a fantastic barbecue grill and a nice wide, yeah. long runway. And I yep. said, those are all the elements for the perfect Comanche fly-in. <laughs> and you're right in the middle of a bunch of Comanche drivers with Kristen Winter not far. And yep, I've talked to her a few times and uh, she's all, I think she's uh, anxious for it too. Yep. So um, we'll... Um, Pete will create a form for you and uh, we'll help you get the word out on Facebook and Delphi and get you a list of your people. And, uh, Pat's working with Bill Kniff uh, and Bill will be getting you uh, names in the area soon. Okay. Yes, I talked to him the other day. So brilliant. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for making uh, things cool. 
Um, some of you from the Western part of the US may know PJ Medella, who's actually coming in for a couple of things. Um, so PJ contacted me a couple of months ago and uh, to say, well, you know, where did all the fly-ins go? And I said, do you wanna just, I said, they've been gone for a while. Um, do you want to you want to put one on? We can we can give you some guidance. And he is uh, had an amazing couple of fly-ins with more coming. So if you are on the left coast, uh, he has started a Facebook group. And if you uh, if you message him on the Piper Comanche Facebook group, or I will stick uh, his mobile number into the chat window. If you're if you're in the Arizona California area, um, he's got another one coming up next month and uh, so the west is often running with fly-ins again and i think there are now either 55 or 85 people in the facebook group he created for the western people to help them start to coordinate around these um, luca marin has done a really amazing uh, comanche restoration in italy and will be creating a uh, a fly-in in europe and then um uh, Michael, some of you know him as Coffee Cough, just bought a hangar home in, I want to say Georgia, and is getting ready to do a big old barbecue. And Pat Lee, was it you who said, can we get uh, fly-ins happening all around the country on the same day for Comanches and just have a giant regional Comanche fly-in? I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I missed you. Yep, I was trying to remember, there was somebody, and I think it was you who said, hey, do you think we could get four or five Comanche fly-ins all happening at the same time? I No, I was uh, just kind of hoping to get one to, to, to get around the area and uh, <laughs> try to get up to us. And, um, you know, you know, every other weekend or, or get a few people together to, to go out to like breakfast or um, dinners or just, you know, just go fly around. Yep. Well, there was some brilliant individual who said to me, CJ, do you think we can get like a bunch of them around the country going on at the same day? CJ, and so and I, when we were talking, this is Ray. Last well, week Ray, I can remember. Yes, now I do. So Ray, it's your fault because we're starting to try to make it happen. And now that you've, now that you've fessed up, I'm pulling you in to coordinate this. Oh, I see. I'll try. <laughs> okay. Good deal. We were all um, talking. We had an idea that uh, if that does happen, if each of those locations, we could set up a Zoom session right there and using the Zoom, see each other. You know, we could show the other people the, the, the fly in we've got. It'd be cool. Absolutely. Like a, you, a giant Comanche rally. Um, so, Bill Kniff and Ray Fay, I uh, expect to be busy. Okay. And thank you. So that's it. Uh, any questions or thoughts on fly-ins or does anybody want to try to get one going in your area? Because Canada is an amazing fly-in destination and has been the source, uh, the, the location for some of the best Comanche fly-ins in the past. So I know we've got a bunch of Canadians here. Does anybody want to step up? And if so, we will bring all of our knowledge and resources behind you. You can either stick your head out here or uh, or uh, stick a note in the chat window or just message me privately. CJ, this is Ray. Uh, I was wondering if we could get it explained by the Comanche people that are Canadian, what the problems, if any, are for us going in and out of Canada on, uh, you know, based on the problems with uh, the medical and whatever their current rules are. Do you, um, do you want a quick answer or now, or would you like me to tap Jim Brown and Serge and see if, uh, and Tim H and see if they're willing to, uh, to talk? Sure, just anything that, will give us the information for flying in and out. Cause I think that holds a lot of friends back that I have here, including myself used to go into Canada a lot. Don't go in much anymore now. Um, hmm. 
Sorry, KJ, I muted you. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, so Tim Tim H has been trying to get to visit friends and family in the in the U.S. Uh, Jim is about to fly back across the border because he's bilocated. Do you want to very briefly touch on um, Canada U.S. cross border situation? Well, right now with the COVID uh, COVID nineteen, you have to quarantine fourteen days, and uh, I believe you're limited to different airports. I'm going into Calgary, but I did get COVID down here in Yuma, so I'm lucky in the way that I don't have to quarantine. Because so you're documented as a recovery. Yes. So if you have the shot, you don't have to, you can go in and out as usual. No, you can't go in and out as usual. Everything's kind of uh, locked down for the COVID and you're very restricted. You can still go in, but you're very restricted. Even if you have the shot. Even if you have the shot. I've had the, I had the shot. Actually, I got the first shot. That's what saved me. Uh, that first shot, or I would have been a lot sicker. Hmm. And you have to oh. have this. So, Jim, yeah, you the, contracted he, COVID after you got your first vaccination. Ah. Yes, I did. And uh, it, thank God I did. I mean, not... Like I wished I had never got COVID. You don't want it because it's not a nice thing. But at the same mm. time, I'm sure glad I got my first shot. So, yeah. So one, the, the only, the only plus side on it is that I don't have to do any more uh, testing. They give you that piece of paper. You just show it up, and away you go. So you, you know, that's the plus. Yeah. There's any plus. Fourteen. Pardon. You still have to quarantine 14 days. Yes, that's my understanding. You have to quarantine 14 days. Yes. Okay. Yep. And uh, Tim has just uh, mentioned, and I think this may be correct, that um, anyone coming across, you have to spend a three-day quarantine in a hotel, um, expect to pay four figures, and then another 14, the rest of the 14 days in other quarantine. Uh, this is Chris Algar here. Chris, you'd know. Yeah. Um, if you come in commercial uh, on an airliner, you can only come into four airports in Canada, uh, at which point you have to quarantine for three days in a hotel at your expense. Now, I was going on a fishing trip and uh, into the States and we're going to come back a couple of months ago. And that's when they changed, they, they brought those rules in. So I was going to have to land at Toronto International, which is no problem, but it was going to be an $800 landing fee and then stay in the hotel. They've now changed that for uh, uh, people like me. I, can land, I, I can't land at my home airport anymore with a cam pass, but I can go into uh, some other airports locally, which have uh, customs, such as Hamilton is close to me. So I can go into Hamilton... Uh, I have to have a positive, a negative COVID test within 72 hours of landing in Hamilton. And then I have to go on quarantine for 14 days. It, uh, it's, it's pretty extensive. And that's why I gave up on my fishing trip. And, and I don't think you want to do a, a, any um, fly-ins until this COVID thing in Canada is, is over. And as of today, just today, in Ontario, we just shut down for another 28 days. So, oh man. So we're, that's what, that's what it's like up here. But. Oh, our hearts go out to you. And how is Dave? Oh, Dave's good. He's at, obviously he's in British Columbia, but uh, a similar situation out there. They've, they've just got some more variants and uh, they put the restrictions on for, for uh, travel. But. Right. Uh, the big thing, that's like with sun and fun. I, I mean, I, I can't go to the States right now. Um, it's just, uh, it's just not feasible. Yeah. Interesting. Chris. Uh, are you, you guys oh, are talking about uh, going international? No, sorry, I'm late. You guys are talking about uh, international flights in your private planes and your Comanches? Yeah. I, uh, Mexico's a little different. I flew down there and back uh, two weeks ago and no, no quarantining or anything on either side. You just fill out a little form saying you've been well. 
And uh, like but you went from the states to Mexico, back to the states, right? I did. Yeah. yeah okay. Yep. I did it all in one and, day, like a right. four-hour round trip. <laughs> you know, but, but as a Canadian, you can go into Mexico, but you can't come back into the United States because I'm on the border right now. We can go into Mexico, but we can't get back. Right. As a Canadian. Wow. Um, it's a very strange world at the moment. And uh, yeah. Adam Height, are you, uh, I don't know if Adam's with us this evening. If not, I can relate his experience flying in commercial to the US from the UK. Uh, his in short was he landed, his visa said nothing about quarantining or anything else. He got a car and drove to uh, Arkansas. Really? It's very. Jeepers. And and actually tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, but on uh, Sunday night or Monday, we have two friends flying in, uh, not in a Comanche, but in a twin commander, but they're flying here to our local airport in Massachusetts, and then they're flying on to Canada, and they've both gotten two shots, and I haven't really spoken with them to find out exactly what they need. They have a can pass, but I'm not, I, I, I think things are loosening up if you have if you have the required shots. Bill, do you want to add to this? Yeah, Bill Josh, Gibson. everything has changed since the last message. In fact, they're now going to drive because it, things have gone completely downhill. They, okay. Uh, Diane, can you give them give yes. the details about the, all the money? They've I can actually read you what they would have to do. It's they unbelievable. They would have to fly to the main airport in Toronto, and then they would have to quarantine in a hotel, which Pain. costs $2,000 for the quarantine. And then they would have to pay... And you think of four hundred and fifty dollars. You can skip the regular message. Yeah, then they'd have to pay three hundred and fifty dollars to have a nurse at the plane when you land, and then one hundred and fifty dollars for each COVID test. That's in Canada. And then she says on and on. They'd have to go to Toronto Pearson, pay the landing fee, park for three days, quarantine at a hotel at two thousand dollars per person. So we shouldn't well, have that's a that's why I gave up my week. fishing trip. Right. Yeah. So no. No, no command you fly this week. Yeah, no. cancel. So all fishing will now be done in the bathtub, your river, or your <laughs> yeah, local you got that pond. right. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> well, this is a perfect unscheduled aside on global flying in the land in the in the COVID world. Yeah, uh, but cool. a very helpful snapshot because this is it. We you can't get this kind of information on the real news or the fake news or whatever it is. Um, so welcome to the COVID world. Do your best to stay safe and do the right thing and respect your fellow human beings. And um, we, we're lucky to fly Comanches and have the opportunity to go places, even if the world's gone crazy. Um, thanks, Pete. The uh, tail horny, the, the autopilots update, uh, that is actually me and PJ uh, back to fly -ins will be here in about 20 minutes to talk about the West Coast fly-ins. So let me see. Um, and we've got, I just got a private message with one more fly-in that's coming and we should have news about that in the Southeast. So um, we've got the Comanche world's coming alive again. I, uh, I just want to celebrate this. This is a type that hasn't been built since 1972 and we are starting to become a cult and that is not a bad place to be for an airplane that's as fine as ours and a group as fun as ours. So congratulations everybody. Autopilots. A year ago we didn't have any autopilots and autopilots were the most critical safety equipment after um, shoulder harnesses in our estimation the most critical thing uh, for the, the value of our, of our type. And the, and the reason is an obvious one. If you think about it, we are a superb traveling machine. Uh, we have long legs. Pretty much all Comanches have either got four or six hours of fuel on board. And if you add a tip tanks, it's a lot longer than that. Ron Kyle, who gave uh, the Comanche Zoom on long distance flying in a stock 250, has flown 10 and a half hours nonstop. Chris Elgar, who along with Dave McElroy, while Dave had COVID, by the way, gave an amazing Comanche Zoom on their four uh, charity flight one and a half times around the world in a stock 180. Um, talk about long distance flying. And yet 
we had no current digital autopilots. And so if you were thinking about what kind of aircraft you were going to buy, you and you wanted this kind of a mission, the lack of, an, of a modern autopilot for the Comanche and the presence of only very, very expensive autopilots. Yeah, as Tim says, there were autopilots, just old, crappy, and really expensive ones. And I don't know if I'd agree with crappy. I mean, our 50-year-old autopilot is in, in A5 pop is still out there kicking. It used some tweaking of the altitude hold, but, but we didn't have modern digital autopilots and the Comanches that didn't have them, which was about half of the fleet uh, was faced with a basically a twenty-five dollars or $35,000 install. So in short, fast forward to today, and thanks to um, efforts by a lot of Comanche owners, and I just really want to point out that like in the pre-Zoom when we were hangar flying, uh, Owen Catherwood, who's here with us tonight, the Garmin GFC 500 uh, Comanche certification, which is well underway, used Owen's Comanche because he had the right thing that, that Garmin was looking for and he made it available for six months. Um, Eric Jones tirelessly advocated with Garmin and got owners together. And um, I keep spacing the very generous 400 owner who made his 400 available to uh, Genesis and Sean Cash. The, the 180 who, uh, and, and Marty uh, Hench who made his 250 available along with Mark Sullivan to the TRIO pro pilot effort. So we as owners stepped up, organized, showed up in t-shirts, like 40 matching t-shirts and got the Comanche type noticed as a viable marketplace. Um, so that's, I'm gonna stop preaching, but I wanted to just congratulate our community for, for coming together in an organized way because it's very expensive and it's a huge effort to get these STCs approved and we did it and we worked with the vendors and now STEC's approved uh, the pro pilot. Um, we, Hans Newbert today said he, he's hoping we're expecting, you know, we're going to see an approval uh, possibly in the next 30 days, certainly within the next three months. Uh, well, I shouldn't say certainly with the FAA, but um, and that was a huge group initiative. So um, in short, uh, prices and um, what I'm planning to do is just briefly talk about status price and update for all the autopilots. So STEC 3100 approved. Um, if you're doing an upgrade from an existing autopilot, there's a huge cost savings. And that is, um, it's basically $20,000 if you're just doing a brand new install plus the install time. STEC works with everything and integrates with everything. So although it's a fairly pricey unit to buy and install, they are the autopilot provider with the longest track record and, um, and, a, and a very high quality option. And the people who've gotten the 3100 so far seem thrilled with it. So um, again, if you already have a two axis autopilot, it is about 10,000, a little more if you need a trim servo. And then they're estimating their install and integration time around 60 hours. Um, many shops work with them and check with your shop for an estimate for your particular Comanche. Any questions about the STEC or any reports from owners that just got them in? Okay, so the next one expected to be approved is the uh, TRIO ProPilot. That's a GPS only autopilot and the least expensive to both uh, purchase and to install but uh, a very high quality and capable um, autopilot. Um, the, uh, it's, it's GPS driven, but it's the most self-contained of all of the autopilots. And as a result, uh, it's got the simplest installation and integration. The uh, price, if you, there's still a group buy special going on until the STC issues. It's not as good as the first one that got the whole project going, but it is, uh, 57, sorry, 59.95, so basically 6,000. Um, and uh, just go to the STC group LLC.com and send an email to um, Jeff Odom. And um, I'll make a note when I'm not talking to put Jeff Odom's email address into the chat window. Um, if you want to get onto the list for that group by special, and it should be good for probably at least another three weeks and possibly a little bit longer, depending on how long the FAA takes. Um, back to group by specials, 
Genesis, if you are a twin driver and want the STEC 3100, you, uh, they are looking for a few more twins and then they'll start the twin project for the approval of the STEC 3100 and the twins. If you commit, uh, it's the STC Group LLC, Pete, uh, the STC Group LLC.com. And uh, if you can just post the link all the way down into the Comanche project, that will get everybody the right stuff. And thank you. Um, so back to uh, Genesis. Oh, go ahead. CJ, uh, this is Pat. Uh, we were going to have the uh, Genesis 3100 put in our plane, and we had it all scheduled for the uh, 5th of April, and they called us, and they're a little bit backlogged now. Um, they want to put it out another eight weeks. Oh, so no. We're gonna, so we're going to be waiting uh, a little bit longer for it. Okay. So I guess That's a lot of people probably a have, good thing. I guess a lot of Comanches came in and said install, yay? I think so. I think a lot of people all of a sudden decided to buy it, and... Uh, our mechanic even ordered it eight weeks out and we were supposed to have it on time, but it just didn't quite show up. Got it. Pat, thanks for the update on that. That really helps yep. everybody to know what to expect. Yes. Any other, any other S-Tech comments? Well, Inbury, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I have an update uh, on what I understand with regards to the trio. They have, um, while the current software is GPS based, the upgraded software that they're expecting to follow up with will allow heading as well as. So whatever device you've got to input heading, um, like an Aspen or a G5 or whatever, uh, that will work. And at some future software upgrade. And it would just be a software upgrade. It would not necessarily require any additional uh, wiring. CJ. Uh, Go for it. Uh, Jim Barry here, I'm calling from Oz. I've, I've got both a ProPilot in my RV7. And it's uh, I'm surprised at that story because it's already got the heading in it as, uh, as well as the, the track. Yep. Yes. Jim, I uh, forgot well, you had an RV7. Um, and thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. To see you again. Um, so the RV, you have the experimental version of the Trio Pro oh, Pilot. Yeah, and so the FAA actually, surprisingly, they added, they asked for a few things to be added, including the get me out of here 180 turn. Yeah, uh, that's oh, is it? Okay. Oh, um, yeah. You want to yep. turn left to press the vertical. Uh, the horizontal hold, you want to turn right to press the vertical hold, and it just does 180. Okay, I think they wanted a separate just get me out of here button rather than the vertical or horizontal. Uh, there was some funny, oh, funny thing that they wanted. How do you like, since many of, there are, there are um, over a hundred Comanche drivers, there were 85 in the first group by special and, uh, it, or let's see, I'm trying to think, they stopped taking deposits at a certain point, but many, many of us have committed to the Trio Pro Pilot. How do you like yours with your RV7? I think it's fantastic. Uh, dangerous, in fact, because it'll keep you within about 10 feet in any direction. Uh, so you need to use track offset to avoid the other traffic. No, <laughs> it, it, it's the greatest autopilot I've flown behind. Not that I'm widely experienced, but it's terrific. Thank you for that report. We are thrilled. Okay, and so it's, all in one, it's all in one piece. You don't, you, you, I, I run it off uh, a, a, a G a Garmin GNC 480 or a, a Garmin 660 panel mount. I've mounted the 660 on the panel and I can switch between either source for GPS and it works perfectly. You can put your flight plan into either the 480 radio or, or the 660 little GPS, portable GPS, and it works just a treat. Okay, CJ. Brilliant. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, when I say heading, I'm referring to magnetic heading as opposed to GPS ground track. Thanks for the clarification, Pat. Good. Um, so finally, uh, I'm not sure if Owen would be allowed to say anything. What I could say for sure is I've seen the snapshots of the uh, Garmin GFC 500 flight track in some of the early test flights in Owen's uh, 260B. Owen, is there anything you can say 
uh, about the current situation with the uh, approval process with Garmin? Uh, I don't know much right now. All I can say, all I know is that they have, uh, they've told me that it fly, the autopilot, fly, autopilot flies my airplane very well. They're very pleased with it. Well, it looked amazing. The flight track looked like it was on rails. It was perfect. So yeah, we're looking, thrilled. Looking forward to actually flying behind it. <laughs> um, the estimates uh, that I last heard were Q2 of uh, this year for a possible approval um, and shipping possibly uh, four, four weeks beyond that, something like that. So it's coming. And the other exciting news is that Garmin is going to be doing the GFC 500 for the twins, which previously had to get the very expensive 600. So for those that are driving uh, Twinkies, um, the GFC 500 may be an option for your future as well. And last I had heard, they were trying to find a couple of 250s to do some comparison analysis on the, the pre-electric uh, flap ones. So I yes. think that's still in their plans to include the full 180, 250, and 260 suite on the initial STC. On the initial STC, that's new news. Okay, everybody, you heard it here first. Oh, and that's fantastic news. So the history behind this news flash is that when uh, Wayne McGee from Garmin came to talk to us about the GFC 500 project, it was only the later model electric flap Comanches that were included. And the um, earlier 180s and 250s, which are actually a greater number of Comanches than the later model electric flap aircraft had been excluded. And Garmin and Zach Grant sent in a list of all by year, the number of Comanches built in each year, which mostly were you know, presumed to be either Johnson bar flaps, etc. And Garmin looked and revisited their decision. And I got a message from Wayne McGee saying, "Can you help us find a 180 or 250 in the in the uh, area where our engineering is up in the Northwest?" And uh, so, oh, and this is a fantastic update that will make people really happy. So the question was whether they were going to include the earlier models in the initial STC request. So, hooray! Any questions on any of these? And just to, just to be clear, that was from a slide on a presentation they gave this morning that lists all of those models as being what they're in progress and plan for certification on. Sweet. All right. I, I took a screenshot of that. I'll try to find it. Uh, this is Josh Simpson, but it, I was on that same uh, call or go to meeting at uh, Garmin and they, they did list every single Comanche on it, which was really good news. Did they include the 400s? You know, I'm going to look on my screen. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll be back in a minute. Yeah, when you find it, we will enable screen sharing and go back to it. Um, because we are very, we're, not, we're already at 823, um, the Tailhorn AD work, um, that's going to be a sun and fun Comanche Town announcement. But uh, if Hans Newbert is here, do you want to briefly comment on what you discovered um, related to uh, Changes, or do you want to hold that for uh, Comanche Town? I just, I just had it on mute. Uh, say, say the request again. Uh, sorry, Hans. On regarding uh, Tailhorn AD uh, work, uh, do you want to do you want to briefly summarize the uh, the bones of of what we'll be announcing at at uh, Comanche Town, or and and your discovery about uh, Piper's engineering change, or do you want to hold that till uh, till Comanche Town? Why don't we hold it till the next? All uh, right. This is Murray. I'd, I'd really appreciate an update because my Tailhorn AD expires in three days, so I've got a inspection scheduled in two weeks. If there's any news that would delay or change that inspection, you can IME directly. Um, okay. Yep. Text did you know that, that's what you told me? Okay, I will. Yeah. What I think we can say right now is, uh, is this. Um, for those of you with your Piper original horns, which includes uh, a lot of us, a surprising number of us, um, as well as those of you with the Australian horn to terminate the AD, um, the... Um, <laughs> Sam, it's a good point and we're figuring the news will propagate, but there's a lot to pull together here. 
in short, um, what the FAA wrote, and this re remains true today, is that there were no NTSB reports of the horns causing um, accidents or incidents, and that there had been only two service difficulty reports in the history of the uh, entire airplane of 7,000 Comanches built. And, um, and at that time, about 45 years, 50 years of operation. So there was a report of a problem and the FAA's responsibility is to keep us all safe. And obviously the report of the problem had to do with, you know, came from an authoritative source, uh, which would be <laughs> the organization that's supposed to protect and promote the type. And so they said, you know, in short, we do recognize that there uh, is some danger of ordering you to do this because there's an element of human error, but here's your AD, we've modified it and softened it a lot which unfortunately didn't help the Australians who were still held to Piper's letter, but it did help the US and those who followed US regulations. And uh, so they said, here's your AD and bring us more data. And this FISDO is authorized to make decisions. So it does look like um, the work is going to proceed um, and it, to, uh, to try to, uh, now that we have that more data, to try to take another look at that AD. So, uh, so keep hope, everybody. Um, your, all of your decisions are good. The Aussie horn's a big, stout piece of material. And uh, the original Piper horn has been a very solid performer with a long track record. So, um, well, let, uh, CJ, but let me just make one comment. Please. The process of getting the FAA to either terminate or change the AD once they have issued it is in uh, part 39. It's a very formal procedure that we have to follow. And the procedure is a, a, a very technical paper uh, showing all the reasons why the should be terminated, backed up by data, test or whatever it takes. So it, it's not a trivial thing. And that, that it's gonna take a little while. What I will tell you is everyone originally back in 2008 fell into the trap and believed the original article that appeared in the flyer that the problem was the torquing of the bolts. That is incorrect. The bolts don't do anything. The problem is, I, I have the drawing from Piper. They originally allowed excessive interference fit between the horn and the counterbalance arm. And the, and the, the tolerance spread was fairly large, but it was also excessive, uh, at least allowed to be excessive. It is a year later after that drawing was issued, Piper made change A to the drawing, which removed that excessive interference fit capability. And what's happened is some of the horns that were delivered by the vendor that Piper used had excessive interference. We're guessing somewhere in the 30 to 40 range. That's all out of a thousand. Over the, if you add up between 58 to 63 models, it's a little over a thousand airplanes. And we're guessing that we know of 30 cracked horns and it's probably, I'll take a wild stab and say 40 at the max. And the reason it wasn't changed right away even though the, the change to the drawing happened in uh, 59, the vendor producing the parts said, we are set up, we're tooled up, we can't make any changes. And in 60, mid 63, Piper chose another vendor to make the horn and the counterbalance tube assembly. And that's when the change occurred. So the, the, 
first of all, I think all the cracked horns have been found by now. If they haven't cracked, they won't. All airplanes after mid-63, I believe, are completely safe. But to get the AD rescinded is, is a bit challenging with the amount of work we have to do to convince the FAA. And that, that's the bottom line. Any questions? I, well, I've got my old uh, horn on the kitchen window if anybody wants it. To, to follow up with what Josh is saying, could I just ask a question about the possibility that the horn, the replacement of the horn, which we went the Aussie route, and uh, smoking rivets on the tail cone. Is there any chance that those things are related? Because we didn't notice that for many, many, many years. Then all of a sudden, the tail... Uh, rivets on the lower reach, not the upper, uh, started to smoke. And we don't know why, how, or what. I don't know if anybody has any experience with that. Uh, you said something about and, rivets. And also, also, I can share my screen. I, I've got this, uh, this thing from the uh, GFC 500 talk from Garmin, if anybody wants to see it. It's just a screenshot that says, uh, PA 24, 180, 250, 260, 260B, 260C are all uh, in pro currently in progress. And uh, go there. ahead and share. You got it. Oh, wait, uh, Pete, before Josh, before you do that, oh, I want to go ahead and, yep, no problem. I want to actually complete the conversation, um, the question that Hans was just starting to try to answer about um, the smoking rivets on the lower reach. Um, oh, sorry. Of the state, but no, no problem. I, I'd ask you to bring it back. This is great, but uh, go ahead back to that discussion. Uh, smoking rivets, uh, exactly where? I, I, I didn't. There are brackets. There are two brackets that hold the stabilator in place, um, and and uh, there's five rivets in the top, each of the top brackets, and five in the bottom. Of, of the of a bracket that looks sort of like a a, a, a V, and and uh, there were smoking rivets on the bottom side. Or, I'm sorry, on the top of each of those brackets, and uh, it's uh, it's. Now you need to understand that on the singles, at least all the standard, standard AD rivets were used, squeezed rivets. On the twins in the 400, they used high shear mechanical fasteners. And the AD is called the high shear rivet AD because <laughs> it became loose. However, the, the early model singles that used standard AD rivets also can become loose and smoke and actually break. Uh, when we did a, a survey of thin airplanes at Laughlin ages ago, uh, there was a single Comanche that had one block completely unriveted. And we were tempted to ground the airplane. Uh, Ford had that authority to do it, but uh, I advised the owner get up early, fly back to Phoenix when it's smooth air and no turbulence because that was dangerous. So the high shear AD applies technically to the twins and 400s, but it also implies that the singles also need the NAS bolts to replace the rivets because the rivets can shear. And I've seen them. So, so we, we do have the mil spec bolts to put back in and it's just but it's just a project that's all okay yep uh, the, the question that got asked though that i just want to make sure um i'm not sure who asked it was that uh there was a question that said the question was is there any chance that there is a relationship between the emergence of uh smoking rivets and the tail rivets on the lower reach and 
the installation of the Aussie horn because the smoking rivets occurred, or they said started to smoke only after the installation of the Aussie horn. That's correct. I, I asked that, Bill Gibson. Okay. That's perfect rendition of it. I think they're unrelated. Okay. Hey guys, That's what I wanted, hey guys, to, this, wanted to hear. This is Michael. Michael, I got a question. Where am I looking for these smoking rivets? I, I, I've had my, my horn replaced, my tail horn, uh, you know, replaced years ago. Um, am I, should I be looking for this problem? Yes. And Josh, you can show him, you can show him the, the, the pictures of the smoking rivets and he'll know, he'll be able to see exactly where they are. Yeah, if I can, yeah, there's a, there's a inspection at, at the very back of the airplane on the passenger side of the airplane is an inspection uh, little thing you can take uh, off. And, I, I, and if, I'm, a, I, I'm aware, I'm actually, I actually prep the airplane for annual every year. And I okay. take that plate off and I look in there and there's actually um, that spring, that uh, trim, that trim, uh, trim spring that's in there. Yeah. I believe it is trim tension yeah. spring. That's really rusty. And some who, someone in, who, the person who installed it actually bent it over so badly that I can't even get that old spring out. I bought a new spring to replace it. It's not rusty. Well, but anyway, well, that. That spring is right in front of you when you look look in that yeah. inspection plate. But get your right arm in the hole with a flashlight, and then okay. stick your head in there and look look all the way to the tail of the airplane, and you'll okay. see, and you'll see, and if you've got a bright light, you can see just you can you can only reach your hand in with a camera, take a picture, and then come look at the picture when you enlarge the picture, and then you can see those. Okay, and I'm looking for. I'm looking for like a dust around the rivets on that tail horn, right? Right, right. They don't, they don't actually smoke in the classic sense because- No, 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 I, I understand. No... It's, it's okay. like a dust, right? It's a dust, but if, if it were in the, in the free stream, the dust would look like smoke. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's just concentric around the rivet. Okay, great. All right, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna I'll go out there tomorrow and go look. Has somebody got a picture of this? Josh does. I, he sent them to me. I, They're I, on your phone, Josh. It might be. I just got to search my phone. It's, it's really no, there. You can actually share your screen on your phone, too. You'd well, need to attend the uh, Comanche Zoom. That may Zoom. be true, but yes. it may be so far beyond my uh, <laughs> Well, you, you, when you touch your screen, there's a little, there's a little uh, uh, icon there that says share. And I think, Phil, uh, I'm sorry, um, Pete's turned it on and it's green. And you could just share your screen. Just share ah, your desktop. I got it. Or, Hang on. I got oh, it. There you go. All right. Just so pull the picture up and then, and then here's, share it. Here's what I can show you. Oh, okay. Can you. Well, you can actually share it. You can actually share it to the Zoom, the, the team here. Uh, He's not on, on the on, Zoom I'm call on his on, phone. I'm on a computer. I'm not on the cell phone. Oh, oh, I got you. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is enlarge this so you can see. And I'm going to just, can you see the rivets yeah that's good josh that's perfect yeah hold, hold it up josh talk again and okay i'm it. talking i'm talking so yeah there you go okay i want to take a it, screenshot it. of that okay okay got it good luck i'll keep talking i'll keep talking i got it i got it <laughs> okay well he we can if, we can we can just send you that we can forward you that photo you don't we'll, need we'll send you the that. whole airplane <laughs> no, no no that's okay too but i i the picture would be great <laughs> It's it's actually a good thing for all of us to learn to recognize. So thank you for, well, for doing that. Yeah, no, actually, that's awesome. In, in this picture, you can see both the upper, which does not have any smoke on it, and the lower one. Oh, stand which by, let me get a shot of that. Yeah. Okay, got yeah. it. Yep. So what you have to do, what you have to do is cut that skin back, peel it back. And then replace those rivets with uh, the 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 bolts, the high shear bolts, because you don't need to put in the riv uh, new rivets. And they sell the kits for each side, but it's still a massive pain to do. Is that a is, it, is that a Webco thing? It is a Webco thing. The okay, bolts, great. the bolts only cost you about fifty bucks. Okay, and this is not something uh, AMP has to do, or can I do it and have my AMP sign off on it? No. No, I, I think, I yeah. think it, I, especially skin work. The two person yeah. job. Uh, 
Yeah. To drill very precisely with a right angle attachment. Uh, when I did mine in like 1990, the uh, I used a metric reamer, which was undersized for the bolt. And then I put the, the bolts in the freezer for about an hour and then tapped them in and it's solid. Oh, wow. There you go. That's a great That's idea. Crucial. That's crucial, Josh, what he just said. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I have? All right. This is amazing. <laughs> Very little room to work back there, but it, it's a good job. Uh, the access panel in the back of the east lodge, and the A&P is the one that guides the drill into the hole. Yeah, because if you if you if you if that hole gets infinitesimally too big, you're out of luck. Oh yeah. And then you torque the bolt. You you torque them after that. Yes, nine inch pounds. Okay, gosh, that's fantastic. Or do you always have to drill them out, or did sometimes they fit? The AD has an inspection procedure. Okay. For all airplanes, and you lift up on the tip of the stabilator, up and down, and four and a half and you you're listening for noise okay noise represents broken rivets or loose rivets and are we going to do all four panels all four uh, reaches of the of the device two on one side two on the other yes. even though they're not smoking you do all four okay great oh this is so useful thank you so much I feel like we're we're taking up the whole Comanche thing here. We should. You know what? You are not the only people that need to know how to deal with something like this, and so this information is now part of the library of information for the whole type. Thank you for having this conversation to all of you. If this it's rivet also, thing keeps, going, if it's also being recorded, so everybody else can share it. All right. Well, if the right. rivet thing keeps on going, we'll put up a free uh, a, here free Comanche. Just come get it. <laughs> we'll give it to Garmin because it does have it doesn't have the electric flaps. Right. How do we um, get an email picture of what he showed us? Well, what we're going to ask oh, Josh to do is to email that photograph to uh, Piper thirty two P and CJ Stump, and uh, it's Piper thirty two P at p does it gmail dot com. <clears throat> yes. I've got a question for Hans whenever we're ready. Go for it, Chris. Um, when I uh, rebuilt our 180, I put a new uh, horn in, which was the one that Piper, uh, the new Piper horn. Uh, now, is that Piper, the new Piper horn, is that still, does the AD still cover that? Like after a thousand hours, you have to do the AD on that? Uh, well, when you, you know, when you buy a new horn from Piper, uh, you, the first time around you got 10 years. And then the five years applies after the 10 years. Okay. Uh, so it's 10 years, then you have to do the AD, and then after that, it's five years. And even though it's uh, a brand new horn, Hans, you still have to take, it, it still has to be taken apart, correct? That is correct, according to the AD as it is written now. So you've right. got to take it apart and send it send it away to be uh, tested. Well, you can do it. Your mechanic should be able to do it with a die penetrant mm -hmm. test. That's all that's required. Yes, the, the, yeah, the die penetrant, yeah. Yep. So when that, when that horn is put back in, how much time do you have with that original horn? If it proves out to be OK, on the first go round, on a new horn? No, on your old horn. If you put your old horn back in and have had it tested, yep. And put five it years. Back in, how many? Yeah, years five years or five hundred hours. Yes. Is the is, uh, is the eighty requirement? Wow. Yep. Um, and that that's part of the reason that this initiative is being supported. Uh, and is so important to so many of us is that the um, ability to uh, to bring the data forward, um, you know, given that we've got a part that's never been in, involved in an accident or incident thus far, and um, that's got such a long track record, 
the the Aussie form is absolutely critical for the Aussies because they didn't get the benefit of the FA's decision to back off. The original letter was draconian. It was every hundred hours. If you can imagine having to take your airplane apart every hundred hours. So the Aussie horn was critical for the Australians. And as you said, see, as you said before, if you do the Aussie horn, you're done. You, don't you have still a- have an inspection requirement. Uh, so you're, but, but it's less onerous. Okay. Every hundred yes. hours. It's yep. a visual thing. Yep. And that's, yeah. So it's got less of a track record, more of an expense. Um, yeah, it's and, certainly. Uh, but many, many people still have their original horns. And so we have two large groups of Comanches. Um, and this, uh, you know, getting the data in will show that we can advocate for our type and that we can mm-hmm. work with our agencies. So we're really excited about this. That's super cool. Yeah. Yep. So, and thank you for everybody, to everybody who has contributed to support this effort. It is, um, it's huge. And we'll be uh, talking more about that at Sun and Fun at Comanche Town. And the information that comes out will go out to everybody at that time. Uh, Or as soon thereafter as we can. I feel like, I feel like I want to talk to Hans and just say, be like Sam Kennison, say it, say it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that, this, that this is going to be reneged. <laughs> Sorry, had to throw that in there. We all feel the same. Go ahead, Hans. Yeah. Sorry, Hans, I think I stepped on you. If I didn't, uh, well, then... What I was trying to do is uh, put a Put a uh, a JPEG on my uh, taskbar. Ah, oh, there it is. I think. No, it didn't. It didn't stick. I wanted to share a photo. Uh, if you let's see. Yep. If you're able to get it onto your screen, I think Pete can uh, enable share screen for you. Okay, I'm just going to open it up then. And this is the teaser. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me put it. Say it! Say it! <laughs> Can anybody see that? Not yet. Not yet. No, you've got to share your screen for the uh, with the blue with the with, with the blue frame. Click on the blue frame desktop. It says once you do share screen. Okay. Uh, do a little here. green button at the bottom. Yeah. The, well, I see taskbar. I don't. Let's see, I get them. There should be a share content or share screen at the bottom of your Zoom window, Hans. And then once you've clicked that, you should be able to click the blue framed. Uh, is that what you're saying, Bill? Yeah, the desktop. Actually, it's, it's a blue frame. It says desktop. Yes. Uh, yeah, desktop. Or, you know, you, you could have several windows open, but make sure it's desktop. Yeah, exactly. Because you, you have to unshare if you go to anything but desktop. Unless you're sharing exactly what you want to share, like if you have your right, photo right. browser open and that's what you want to share, then share your photo browser or your files, you know. Right. I just, I just did a share. Uh, no. How do I? We got it all. It, it was only going to be a piece. We'll figure it out later. Okay. Uh, All right. Bill was just sharing his screen. Yep. So <clears throat> I do not have the Aussie horn in in, the, in my Comanche. I have. I, I actually don't know which one I had, but it's the it's the one that was. Uh, 337 then approved and all that. I don't have that in front of me, but <clears throat> sorry, I'm in a group of people here. <laughs> okay. Let me move away. Um, anyway, 
what is what is the uh, inspection time on that and is the smoking rivet a pro is the smoking rivet problem prevalent with the other than the Aussie horn the two are separate the two are separate the two are separate and I think that I think it's the smoking rivets are pretty rare okay well this you know things like this have me concerned because this airplane actually um, you know, Chris, Kristen Winter worked on this airplane for years uh, with a prior owner, um, and I I purchased the airplane anyway because it was like after all the Comanches I went through to see to to purchase it purchase one. This one was by far the the cleanest and the best one I could find. It had its fair share of problems, and at one point I shared with CJ my uh, my taking home story of everything failing in the dark. It was a lovely story. I, I live to talk about it. But, um, you know, there's, you know, it was in a corrosive environment. It was in, uh, you know, it was in Sacramento, California, where it's damp most of the time in a damp hangar. And um, there were some concerns about corrosion and things like that. So I have since addressed some, some of those things, but the smoking rivets, you got me worried. So I need to go see for myself. They are really hard to see. And you might do what Josh said, stick your camera in there, take a flashlight, a mirror. They're really hard to see. That's why the mechanics often say they're okay when, they're, when, when they haven't really inspected them, I guess. Because ours have yeah. been fine forever. And now yeah, obviously I, have not been fine forever. Yeah, I'm, I, I, these are times when I wish uh, Bert Lewis was on the horn with us, you know, or on the Zoom with us. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. Yeah, yep. Um, on Amazon for about $10, there's a very cool um, flashlight with a, uh, um, it's on this bendy metal thing. And so you pull the bendy metal thing out and the flashlight's on the end, and then you can poke it into strange places. You do have to form it. It's not like an endoscope, but uh, sometimes when I need to look in odd places, I use my flashlight with the bendy thing and my cell phone camera. To uh, take a picture and magnify whatever the flashlight's looking at. That's, that's All right. excellent. I, I actually have an endoscope for looking inside the cylinder and stuff like that. So I'm going to stick that back there and see what I see. Let us know what you find. And um, did will. you get your endoscope on? Uh, did you get the sort of inexpensive couple hundred on Amazon, or did you get like a medical endoscope that you repurposed? No, I got some cheapy, I got two for the price of one, 79 bucks or something. I, I don't even know. There was some odd brand, but they're, they're Wi-Fi enabled. So you hook them up to your iPad and you can actually see what you're doing and uh, then snap a picture on your iPad. So, kind of cool. They were like, I want to say it was $79 for two of them. I have a feeling yeah. that you may have found something a lot of Comanche drivers might want to have. Um, would you mind contacting me afterwards and we'll see if we can arrange them? Um, to get that available to the group. And we'll be talking sure, about how good. to do that in a few minutes. Okay, um, let, me, let me go back in my Amazon purchases and see when I got that. Perfect, Michael, thanks. And uh, we'll look forward to all getting <laughs> endoscopes. <laughs> More oh, and ways by the to way, on the, on the name tag issue, I probably yes. go ahead and plan on doing paper sticky name tags because um, I did get a I did get a hold of Jim, but he's not doing name tags anymore. He's passed it to another company, and um, I'll talk to them probably Monday at this point. And that's going to be a real that's going to be a jam to get them to you in time for Sun and Fun. Sounds we'll good. Right. We will prevail. <laughs> and yes, um, just to, yep. So that um, any last questions about? Tailhorn ADs. Um, PJ Medella has just joined to talk about his fly-in, but first Matthew Smith is back to talk about the Comanche Docs Library. But any last questions about autopilots, uh, Tailhorn AD works? Yeah, CJ, this is Mark Knuckles. On the GFC 500, is there a pre-buy on that or is it, uh, is it not for pre-buy? We wish. Garmin does not. Well, actually, Owen, what do you think? Any chance in hell? I so it might freeze over. Who knows? <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. No, uh, that's just not something that Garmin seems to do. Um, it has actually 10, no more than that. 20 years ago, Northeast did a Garmin, uh, when the early Garmin GPSs came out, there was a group by, 
And so uh, we will make one last request to uh, see if Wayne McGee wants to, to find out if the powers that be might be willing to play. And that beautiful 9090 pop that you can see there, that's the Garmin GFC 500 dress bird. So, all right. Um, I am going to introduce Matthew Aaron Smith. And Matthew is a relatively new Comanche owner who um, is also a very cool software geek and general geek and uh, has been flying all around the country and is relatively new to him, Comanche. And Matthew and I got to talking about the fact that he was starting to pull together all of these uh, service manuals and parts manuals and other things we need to look at all the time. Um, and uh, it's just, I'm just going to stop there and say, Matthew, what you have done has already benefited so many pilots who, uh, and mechanics who need to get the right service, a relatively late edition uh, service manual or um, parts manual or, and people have just loved the museum section with the original brochures. And so with no further ado, welcome to you and your new bird. Howdy. Thanks. I, uh, you know, you mentioned, I, I, I get, I don't know if I'm a very new Comanche owner. I've had it for about three years and, uh, I'm generally mechanically inclined and I love playing with these things. And I also love flying. Uh, just, I had this before I talk about the thing. I, I flew to Leadville the other day and got this sweet certificate. I didn't know they did that. I just wanted to get a landing at the highest airport in North America, but it turns out if you go into the FBO, they'll print you a very official looking piece of paper. It says, congratulations on on landing at the Leadville Airport, so it was kind of cool. I, I took a, <laughs> took my Comanche straight. So the uh, I apologize. The website I have a I have a backlog of stuff. Thank you to everyone who's been contributing things. Um, I have quite a bit of stuff sitting in my uh, in my backlog to add to the site. Um, but between work and everything that's been going on lately, I I haven't had a chance to uh, to jump in and update that. Um, but I will be getting to that shortly. Um, but yeah, last week I I. I finished annual and uh, and then I flew my plane from Mammoth, California to Los Angeles to Taos, New Mexico, nonstop, and then uh, up to Denver and uh, did a little snowboarding week trip last week to make sure that everything was good after annual. Um, <clears throat> so let's see, I think I can share my screen. I guess we'll just do a quick walkthrough of the site for those who haven't seen it. And if there are any questions, or anything about it, I'm uh, happy to happy to answer those. Um, so it's a pretty, uh, you know, it's it's nothing it's nothing flashy, uh, but as uh, as people submit things and ideas, I've been adding sections to the site. Um, generally, when you land here, there's two ways you can access the site. Hopefully, easy to remember is uh, pipercomanche.info. Uh, just in case something happens to that copy, the exact same information is mirrored over at the Northeast Comanche site, docs.northeastcomanche. Every time I update anything on the site, it automatically pushes to both of these places. So it um, doesn't matter which URL you have, they will both work. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the breakdown on the site, I, on the main page, uh, as you can see, is kind of a, a dumping ground that needs to be organized a little bit. Um, but I try to keep a kind of a log of new stuff. So if you just drop by, you, you know, what's the latest and that's where I throw little uh, credits. Um, speaking of new data, I, one of the more relatively newer things here, instead of having to, uh, to email me or, or figure out how to get stuff to me, I have this handy new um, Dropbox link. And if you hit that, you get this nice little uh, submission form and anything you drop here shows up in a Dropbox. I get a little email about it and uh, I can add that to my queue of work I have to do. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that should make things a little more streamlined. Um, down below this lengthy log of uh, things. So I guess we're, we're coming up on a year of having this. I think I did the first, first posting in, in May of last year. So that's pretty, pretty wild. Um, the, uh, the listing originally started um, with data from Piper's owner publications catalog. They, Piper has this nice PDF of all the stuff they provide, but then they make it hard to actually find the stuff. Uh, and that was kind of the uh, impetus behind putting this thing together. Um, I still haven't, 
we've had some talk about uh, there's a desire to create a version of the site that you can uh, like run from a USB stick or something. The tool I use to create the site, I haven't found an easy way to do that yet, but I haven't forgotten about it. I'm still working on that. Um, I'll get something up in the next few months. Um, there were also, I think the next thing that will appear are some 337s in addition to updates to the museums. Uh, there was some stuff floating around. There was a lot of chatter about the uh, ski box 337 recently. Um, and I've received those files. I will post them. I guess I should give myself a goal of sometime in the next two weeks getting all that stuff up. Um, I down lower on the site, I have uh, I try to keep current a uh, list of things that I would like to add to the site. Um, so if you're wondering, you know, this is a, a good place to start. Some of this stuff is kind of hard to find. So uh, I, I'm pretty good at hunting for things and, and I've gotten a lot of submissions from people, but there's still stuff out there. Um, for instance, I'm trying to get the full collection of original owner's handbooks and uh, we've made great progress there. There's still a few out. Um, and of course, if you have interesting stuff for the uh, museum, that's a fun new section of the site um, that I haven't really uh, had a, figured out how to organize. We'll, we'll collect some stuff and then we'll organize it. But uh, the original price lists, um, I actually have a newer uh, price list and sales brochure uh, that I need to clean up and get uploaded. Um, I don't know which one is off the top of my head, but this is a uh, cool little historical stuff. So if anyone has, uh, you know, sales brochures or price lists or things of that nature floating around for different years. Um, love to have that to uh, share with everything. With Matthew, everyone. can um, you briefly, can you briefly bring up that original sales brochure just cause it's so fun to look at there. Yeah, this thing is really, really cool. So uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, um, this was one of the first museum submissions and it's got like the classic, I don't know. It's awesome. Um, gives you all the, you know, marketing, uh, talk. Let's see if I can zoom out so you can actually see the whole thing on one page. Um, yeah, it turns out these are a little harder to scan because they're they're a little larger than your standard scanner. Um, so I really appreciate the. This is a really nice, high quality copy that was. Um, oh, I I don't remember off the top of my head who submitted this, but he went and got it uh, scanned at uh, Kinko's, and so we have this great copy. Wow, look at that roomy cabin. There's so much room. The lady is like. It, Dwarf they, inside that enormous cabin. I, I, was, I, I had the same comment. They found a very tiny model for this uh, for this shot here, <laughs> and uh, same model I think for this uh, this picture here. It makes the Comanche look like a massive uh, traveling machine. Um, one of the really neat things about these uh, brochures is they did include the original paint uh, combos, uh, which I think is really cool. Um, I plan to repaint my plane in the original or maintain the original scheme whenever I actually get around to repainting it. I I maintain my plane kind of backwards, start with like the hardware, the engine, engine monitors, and then someday I'll add avionics. And then sometime after that, I'll do the uh, exterior and interior. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, collection starting to expand. Originally, this was uh, intended to be more of a service data uh, repository um, to keep uh, maintenance info alive, uh, because I am one of those very hands-on owners, um, rather mechanically inclined. And so I do all owner assisted annuals with a attentive IA and, uh, but you, you know, you can't really do any of that work without the proper data. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, there's been for a long time, there were older revisions of the, uh, uh parts catalog and service manuals floating around out there. And, uh, I'm lucky to have, uh, some other similarly minded Comanche owners that live uh, near me and keep their plane at uh, Pawthorn where mine resides. And uh, I was able to get my hands on a copy of this manual that was newer than the ones I saw floating around online. And I realized that uh, there was a lack there. So I started to, uh, to add this, uh, the data as I could find it. Um, and I'm really interested in the historical uh, evolution, I guess, of the manuals as, as Piper updates them, which is why I'm interested in getting older versions of them. Um, the one example I do have is where that is really useful. Um, if you need to rebuild your fuel selector on a 260B, the very latest version of the service manual says, you can't do it. You got to send it out for overhaul. But if you look in, I think the 98 version, it gives you directions on how to disassemble and, uh, and overhaul it and reassemble it. Um, so useful stuff like that. I have um, 
many versions of the parts catalogs for the single. Uh, the title here, a part number is from the, you know, from the catalog. The title will take you to the latest revision. Um, if you, depending on your computer, if you click on it, it may, it'll probably just load the PDF and show it to you, um, which is which is great for a quick reference. While I was doing my annual, I think I actually referred to the uh, the manual uh, just on the website more than I actually did a downloaded copy. Um, but, and again, this is, uh, I'm kind of showing you my, this is on a Mac, might be a little different on, uh, on other computers, but there's generally a way to save this. Um, the most straightforward way for everyone is if you right click and do a save link as, and you can, uh, it'll download to your computer and you have an offline copy that you can keep forever. Um, while the, uh, the titles are linked to the most recent revisions, um, good, good time to call out. The latest thing I've seen for the twin Comanches is a 1982 revision. And I know there are newer versions out there. So if anyone has a newer version, I would love to have a copy. Um, but for instance, in the case of the, uh, the singles parts manual, say you wanted a 1973 version, you would just hit the 1973 link and it's gonna take you to that older uh, revision of the manual. Uh, and same thing, right click, save as, and you'll have a copy on your local machine. Um, so we have so the, the parts Matthew, catalog. Matthew, can I yes. ask you to stop for just one second? Um, yes. Does everybody get what Matthew's doing? Because you you're talk fast. Does everybody get how to save it to your local machine? Or Ma Matthew, would you just do it one more time really slowly for those of us who are um, challenged? <laughs> sure. The, um, if you right click on the title, because these are direct links to the PDFs and do uh, there, it's save link or save as, depending on your web browser and your operating system. Uh, then that will do a download um, of it. You can save it wherever you want, like uh, my downloads folder full of junk. And if I hit save, it'll it'll store it locally. Um, if you wanted an older version of it, you just do the same thing with these year links. Um, this would be the 1982 version, save that copy. Or if you click on it, it'll, it'll load it up here and, and you can view it directly in your browser. <clears throat> The phones should be similar. Uh, you can view these on your phone. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure exactly what, I think it's like a long press on the link and it'll come up with like a save to your phone yep. or tablet. These are really so great to your, have on your tablet. On your phone, because I use my iPhone all the time. Um, when you open the document, there should be a box with an up arrow. And when you hit that, it's gonna, if it, it'll pop up a list of either people you could send it to or things you can do with it. And typically you can save it to your books or your Dropbox um, or your, your cloud or drive. Another note, everything that I have, all the PDFs that I've uploaded to this site, I have, a, I should, unless I missed something, they've all been OCR. You should be able to search, do like a full text search in here. Um, Ooh. The accuracy of that, you know, it could be a little, could be off. Um, but, uh, and some copy and paste. The newer versions are, have much better um, OCRing than some of these older scans. Um, but yeah, they should all be searchable, copyable, printable, um, you know, whatever you need to do there. So we have the, the first section, of course, is your parts catalog. The second section is your maintenance manual. Same exact setup where the the link here takes you to the most recent revision, which would be 2009 here or 1998 here. And the older versions you would get by using the link. Um, oh yeah, another thing that I've had a surprisingly difficult time finding uh, is uh, the inspection report for the Twin Comanche. I know it's inside of the service manual, but I really like uh, personally, I like having this one page, this, well, not one pager, but standalone PDF you can print a copy of every year for your annual. Um, that's just a nice little extra thing. So if anyone happens to have that uh, report for the uh, Twin Comanche, that would be great. Send it on over. Uh, any question on the, the, the main maintenance data here, these maintenance manuals and parts catalogs? Um, Matthew, I'd like to relay a question from the chat window. 
where you I know you have a list of things you're still looking for. Can you show us where to find the list so that we know whether something that we might have is something you need or not? Yes, uh, that is on the main page on the home page when you first show up uh, down toward the bottom under your wish list. Yeah, uh, I could promote that, I guess, to the top of the page. I kind of like having the little change log up there, though, so you have a quick glance at what's new. The change log is great because we can jump to things from your change log. I've used that, but the just knowing that your wish list is at the bottom, down here, and then <laughs> just a quick zoom note. If you're attending this Zoom using your iPad, iPhone, or Android, you'll note that, that these letters look impossibly tiny because I'm on an iPhone. You can actually zoom in from your iPhone that with the usual pinch and expand, and you'll be able to see Matthew's uh, any part of Matthew's screen all zoomed in. Yeah, it's probably better for you to do that than for me to zoom my screen. <laughs> and I'll, I'll also drop the link here in the chat real quick if somebody hasn't. Yep. And, uh, and also no. this one. And I put in Oops. meetings, uh, I put in docs.northeastcomanche.org, the mirror site as well, because that's a central site for the Comanche Zoom recordings as well. Awesome. That's right. Um, and then uh, there's some additional items here, just very briefly. Um, service bulletins, uh, I put the latest revision of the index that I've updated this from, so I need to go back and get a fresh update in case there are any new service bulletins. Um, these are available on Piper's website, but their interface for finding them is a little wonky, and I expanded the table to include uh, references to associated ADs um, here. They're not linked yet. That's another future thing I'd like to add is the actual, you know, AD locally. So we have that easily accessible without having to go search the FAA site. Um, but this gives you all the service bulletins. I think I have every single service bulletin. Yes, yes, I have every single service bulletin uh, that has been uh, published up to my last update. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean every single version, but at least the, the latest version at the time. Uh, I don't have, uh, sometimes there are historical versions, I don't have all of those. Um, service letters, almost identical, same exact thing. All the service letters, oh, I'm, in case it wasn't immediately clear, uh, the service letter number or service bulletin number is linked to the PDF. So you click it, you get the, the PDF. And just like on the um, service manual page, a right click on that link and a save as will download the uh, PDF to your local machine. Um, fun stuff. Uh, these are all the uh, handbooks slash POHs um, that I have collected for the Comanches thus far. Uh, compared to the state of this list, Six months ago, uh, we are doing awesome. And this is all uh, contributions from the group. Um, the majority of these were, were submitted by the group, not things that I found out on the internet. Um, so that's really cool. Um, in the case of the, uh, I think uh, this is the only plane, the, uh, the um, 1962 to 64, uh, 1A and 250 is the only one where I have two different revisions. I'm a little less concerned about collecting multiple revisions here, but if you have a different year version of a uh, one of these books, I'm happy to, uh, to archive that here. Um, so you can see I'm still missing a few, and if you have them, that would be awesome. These are not the Kilo manuals. Um, that's a whole separate bee's nest. Project. Uh, these, the, a whole other project. These are the original Piper uh, books. So you click in. Um, and similarly, uh, these are scans um, that I have also, uh, you know, done a little cleanup work on, um, page straightening, and they're OCR, so you can search them. Um, hopefully, useful. There, <laughs> uh, there are a ver variety of levels of quality depending on, you know, the original scan. Um, and I, I think, you know, sometime in the future, we we may be able to extract a lot of this information and create some really cool. Uh, iterations or, or revisions of these, but uh, these will probably come in help, helpful. 
for uh, someone. Uh, at the very least, it's kind of cool to like uh, go through the different years uh, owners manuals and just get an idea of the differences between each year, performance, kind of that sort of stuff. Yeah. And these manuals are legal to use to fly your airplane. I mean, this is the legal manual. If you don't have the Kilo manual, this is perfectly legitimate to have in your airplane. And a copy. I did not edit them. <laughs> they, are, <laughs> they are the exact scans. Uh, all I've done is clean them up and uh, like straighten the images and do the OCR on the text. So yeah, right. they are the original manuals. Yep. Can really get you in a, out of a pinch someday if you need to be flying because you are required to carry one of these in your airplane. Now, if it's on your iPad, does that count or does it have to be a printed copy in the plane? <laughs> I don't can know the somebody, to uh, George, Merriam, or can somebody, or Malcolm, can somebody answer that? So what was the question? question. <laughs> uh, the question is, can you have a scanned, an exact scanned copy of your POH on your iPad? Is that a legal way to carry uh, the, uh, the required POH in your aircraft? Or does it have to be printed? I dare someone to prove that it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> My answer would be as as long as you have a POH in the airplane, it's uh, it's good and it reflects the uh, the make and model of the aircraft and the uh, uh, the date and, and that kind of stuff. Um, if it's a copy, um, you know, something that comes from Sporties, I don't think works. Uh, but if it's a reflection of the Piper um, manufacturer, yes, um, even if it's a copy. Cool. There yep, and it. Linda Reaver just piped in also that. So it looks like to everybody's knowledge, Malcolm says, dare you to prove it isn't. George Mary has <laughs> been a CFII for 50 years. And so uh, we'll, uh, I would say if you've taken the trouble to get a scanned original copy and it matches the make and model of your aircraft, as George just said, you're good. Doesn't it have to be so more than make and model? Doesn't it have to be serial number? Good point. Good point, Malcolm. Yes, because the serial numbers do govern. So would, what Malcolm said, not what I said. You still need your serial number specific weight and balance, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Would, would this count as the main POH? Or yes. does it need to be the Piper report signed to your serial number? Yeah, that current weight and balance has to be the current weight and balance. And that right. um, is generally a part of your, um, your airplane flying hand, uh, handbook. Um, yeah. it, it has to have the correct numbers, the current weight and balance. Yeah. And you'd have to have any supplements as well. Sure. Yes. So this might get you out some, some of a scrape, but you'll still need some other stuff in the plane. Yep. <laughs> and Pat Kiefer just correctly wanted to remind us, you also are required to have your, um, your equipment list, the, uh, minimal equipment list or whatever it's called. There's several um, ways to do that. Yeah, I think I have. <laughs> I think I have one of those. You also need your three three sevens, uh, and any and I think supplements were already mentioned for all your STCs. Yep. So, um, uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Matthew. One thing: can you go back to the place where you had the service letters and you or service things where you had linked all? Yes, that. The reason I want to draw your attention to this is this may save you money because it will save your A&P time. And Chris and Matthew, you just created this. This doesn't exist anywhere else. Is that right? You went through and pulled out all of the references and made these, a table out of them. These are available on uh, Piper's. This is a combination of data. So this is I started with a service bulletin and service letter index, which this is out of date. So I need to get a fresh one. This was last May, so I'll generate a new one. Piper has a PDF that has a service letter index, which has a table like this in it. To find the actual um, uh, text of the letter, you have to go to their website and use this thing. And it's not the most straightforward, uh, easy single page way to view uh, the publications. Um, so I kind of grab because you know you have to go through through this list. And you have to click on one of them and it loads up. Right. And you can view a PDF and then you have to do this, or you could just come here and they're all on a big table and you can just click on them directly. You can search directly through the text. 
I have a basically I have a script that goes through uh, the return from uh, this website and then downloads yep. all the PDFs when I do a refresh. So the um, reason that I wanted to really emphasize this, everyone, is that um, Matthew's on a really high speed connection, and you saw that little hesitation when he went into the Piper website. Our A and P's are typically not always on super high speed connections, and uh, don't also always have the know how to go in and and pull out all this stuff. So here it is all in one place and it may um, save you time and money to either point your a &P to this. This is a free service. Um, and, um, or for those whose a &Ps are like, I've been doing this for 50 years and I'm not doing that, but you can um, offer to help and you may find your bill is, is, you know, if every hour is $100, you may find your bill is hundreds of dollars less if you can provide this kind of support to your to the people working on your airplanes. Not only not to mention, you'll know a lot more about what's going on. Um, yeah, so Matthew, thank you for doing this. this but yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Um, I, I do need to get around to adding ADs. Again, they're all available from the FAA, but sometimes it's nice to have everything right there in a little table you can just grab the data from. Um, other sections, I've been collecting uh, some information on the factory autopilots. Uh, these are actually service manuals, uh, which, you know, if you're still flying some uh, original Piper, uh, say the pitch trim, uh, this is the service manual. Um, might help you keep that uh, keep that flying. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still missing a few of them, uh, but I have uh, I have the one these these three here, uh, and I have s some of the Century info um, that was uh, submitted. Uh, Century three POH installation manual and service manual. Um, then of course we looked at the museum already. Uh, the final thing I have on here is just a little. Um, Comanche related stuff from the FAA, the, the TCDSs, um, which I pulled last year. I need to collect the additional ones for the, uh, for the propeller groups, um, but your engine and airframe uh, TCDSs are here. Just for quick reference, these are of course available from the FAA, um, latest revisions. Uh, not that I think our TCDSs are changing very often, I guess I was kind of surprised that the latest revision to the TCDS for the uh, single was 2006. Um, yeah, that is uh, is there and gathered. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, 337s, I'll start adding a place for that. That could uh, will hopefully be something helpful for people looking for uh, supporting documentation for modifications. Any uh, Any questions or things you want me to go back over because I went too fast? I know I talk a little too quickly sometimes. <laughs> cool. This is just totally awesome. It's amazing. And uh, I, I've just been looking at the, uh, the sales brochures and stuff like that. I, I think you've uh, given us all hours and hours of stuff to look at here. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. And I think it was uh, Les and Michael that sent me the, uh, the two pieces in the museum. And as I mentioned, I do have another uh, a newer sales brochure I need to add. I think it's the uh, B model um, sales brochure. So, Matthew, uh, wish Mike me Newman. some time. <laughs> hey, Mike. Matthew, Mike Newman here. Uh, yeah, I'm the one who sent you the uh, sales brochures, and um, yeah, and I have a, had a question about the. Um, uh, so we have we have available two different revisions for our uh, POHs or our service manuals. What, what would be the advantage of uh, downloading anything but the latest revision? Uh, in general, I would always go with the latest revision. I'm, in general, I'm interested in collecting the historical revisions just to have them um, for comparison purposes. The one example I have of a really useful time to have an older revision is that uh, the the rebuilding of the fuel selector on the uh, on the two sixty um, <clears throat> model now and where you're supposed to be using the latest service data, uh, but 
when it's just a bunch of O-rings you're replacing in the uh, in the uh, fuel selector, it's it's nice to have the have a set of directions on on how to right. do that instead of having to send that off for overhaul somewhere. Let's see if I can find that. But yeah, basically the latest, the 2009 revision has a change bar and says, uh, remove the whole unit and send it out for overhaul. But if you look one version back, it says, you know, take the thing out, take it apart, replace the rings, lubricate everything, make sure you don't lose the little balls, put it back together. So I, it's exactly what I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, Thank you. So I, I hope I, I have this, this like pipe dream of someday... <sighs> extracting the data from these service manuals into more of like a web page format where maybe you could have inline history like you see the latest version but maybe there's something you could expand to see older language there or something this vague idea i haven't really i haven't really formulated it but that's generally why i'm trying to collect all the versions if possible right <laughs> matthew great job absolutely great job um and on, on everything I'm presenting, on pulling this all together. Um, for years, I was like, hey, can somebody make this searchable on all of these documents, the POHs, the, and, and although we, and some people are like, can you make it an app? We haven't quite gotten to the app yet, but this is it. You know, these are OCR documents and getting really good OCR on some of these old things is non-trivial. So the high quality scans that everybody's been providing and that you did, um, the way that you've straightened things out, OCR'd them, made them searchable, made them downloadable. It's, it's been the answer to so many people's prayer. Thanks. And I, yep. I, so I guess crazy. I went out and made something that I thought would help me out and yes. could possibly help everyone. And helped <laughs> everybody. Way to go. And we found you and we were like, oh my gosh, are you serious? Can we host this for you? Can we, this is amazing. Come and talk to us about it. Get the word out. So um, there's tons Thank of people you. texting saying thank you what's your phone number matt phone number i can put it in there here i'll put it let me put it in the chat uh let's see i haven't i'm sorry i see some messages i haven't replied to everyone yet all good too busy um, talking we are getting really close to um 9 30 and we are uh we have one topic that i'm gonna do a what we call a drive-by shooting which is a high speed overview and then I think we should probably take this up at another Zoom after Tracy Ligon next week talks about aircraft appraisals. And uh, Tracy's a really experienced Comanche driver. He's owned several and a long-term aircraft appraiser. So it'll be really interesting to hear his talk. It'll be great and awful at the same time. And we can also talk about why the values of the Comanches have been going up and taking a pretty steep rise in the last year. Um, and that'll be fun too. Any last questions for Matthew on this really, really critical capability? And I got a nice picture of my boob in the reflection. We've got an open mic. Okay, cool. Um, PJ, are you still in here before I jump into the very fast drive by shooting? Yeah, I'm here, um, PJ. Awesome. Um, folks, going back to topic number uh, two, fly-ins for 2021, um, you met Pete Morse, you met Pat Lee from the Minnesota area, and I'd like to introduce PJ Mandela because PJ uh, and I started talking a while ago about the lack of fly-ins in the western part of the U.S., and um, I have to say, PJ, that the, and we, we talked about like, well, you know, for the first one, you know, what do you want? Like a really big wide strip because, uh, you know, people, initially there was like, hey, do we want to go to Catalina Island? And I'm like, oh my gosh, you really want everybody to come. So you pick something that there's just no question that you're going to make it in and out um, if you can fly a Comanche at all. And what you did and what you made was brilliant and greater than, gosh, I mean, just really cool. So, um, and PJ is also working on, uh, uh, some very cool stuff uh, for making landing gear more efficient, making that available in group buys. So it's a real pleasure to introduce you. You've got so much going on. Yeah, hey, good evening, guys. Uh, this is PJ. I'm out here in Phoenix, Arizona. Sorry, my camera does not want to take a picture of me this evening, so I'm going to have to go with that video. Um, with that said, uh, CJ, thank you for introducing me to the group. Um, you know, when I looked at a lot of the fly-ins that the East Coast guys were doing, 
um, I was sitting here going, why, why isn't there one on the West Coast? You know, I was kind of being envious and a little bit jealous, I guess. But <laughs> then I reached out to uh, CJ about it and she mentioned, you know, how to go about doing this. So I said, okay, let me put something together. And I got some documents. And then, you know, thank goodness for the modern technology with Facebook. Uh, one of the guys I connected said, hey, why don't you create a little group on the on the Facebook, and uh, we just named it Southwest uh, Piper Comanche Group, and I put it on, and I didn't think I was going to get a lot of response to it, but to my surprise, the first flying we did, which was in uh, Kingman, Arizona, and, I, and like CJ was saying, I wanted to select a big, long runway where uh, you know, you don't know how the skill level of every pilot is, how frequently they fly, and um, in the restaurant, of course. So when we looked at that, that was the most ideal airport. And to my surprise, we had 16 uh, Piper Comanche show up between uh, PA 24 180s to 260s. It was a great gathering. Um, as an introductory type of deal, I printed some t-shirts for the guys. Uh, that was great. So we had a huge uh, turnout. It was really fantastic. And then immediately they were all asking, hey, when do we do the next one? So we put one together in Sedona, Arizona. And again, we had about 15 aircrafts. Uh, I, I mean, it's just, it's just fantastic to see uh, all these guys show up and so much information. They have so much knowledge, a lot of experience in their own planes, you know, techniques of how they land versus all the modifications and mods they've done. It was just a great wealth of information to learn. Um, I, I'm kind of a novice to all of this. For me to uh, meet up with these guys was just phenomenal. It was just exciting. And so we had our third flight, and I think we're on to our fourth one this Saturday, which uh, we're all flying to a place called French Valley up in California. Uh, looks like we've got 10 aircraft signed up. Um, usually there's at least two in aircraft. So I'm, like, I'm hoping it's at least 15 to 20 uh, fellas showing up, you know, ladies and guys. It, it, it's just a fun group of people. And our only agenda is uh, have flyouts, get together, have lunch, chit chat, you know, and talk about what's good, what's not good. And then we all fly back home. So it's been super fun. I, I mean, it's, uh, we hope one of these days, even the West group can actually go central and to the East and and you just make our way and meet up a lot of the guys that are even on this Comanche Zoom. So um, it's been fun. I, I, I don't know what else to say other than it's been great uh, fun. And some of the older group guys that used to be part of the uh, Comanche group from years back are signing up and uh, flying with us, which is very exciting to see. So yeah, CJ, thank you for leading me in the right direction. And uh, I can't imagine this. It, I actually have 55 Comanche drivers signed up on this group now. It's just phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. So if you guys are anywhere nearby, I'd love to welcome you. You know, Come fly with us and share all the wealth of information like Matthew has put together. It's, uh, I'm listening to him and I'm going, wow, this is a, a great portal for Comanche drivers to get on and, and learn a lot of things. It's, it's good deal, man. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. DJ, fantastic, fantastic job. And um, I just uh, want to say that part of what was cool is like, if you look at Pete Morse, who's been doing fly-ins forever, um, we used the work that Pete and Ron and Lynn Ward had done to, and I, I conveyed that information to you, PJ, and then you did something even cooler and different with it. And so it's now we can share with each other our discoveries and make it even better. And as we get these, these groups starting fly-ins all around the country um, and, and renew our directory so that when we fly cross country or, or overseas, we can all find people to hang out with and stay with and call for help if we're flying a long way and we're like, oh my gosh, something happened that I didn't expect. Um, so this is a, this renaissance of community, of, of collegiality and of, um, of just you know, neighborliness, helping each other I don't want to sound all motherhood and apple pie, and I don't uh, mean that at all. It's it is essential to keeping us to keeping us going. So thank you for what you're doing, everybody. That includes Pat Lee, PJ, uh, Luca Moren, who's it's three or four in the morning there right now, um, 
uh, you know, there's a bunch of people that I think you'll be hearing from soon in different parts of the country that are starting to, like Coffee, Cough, uh, who just bought that that strip and uh, and will be starting a fly-in. So, uh, Russ Wright started doing fly-ins in the South, and um, and that's that's been starting to get people going. Part of the reason I want to emphasize how important this is comes from Kristen Winter, who I asked several years ago. Kristen, the Northeast is a, an old you know brick and mortar company. It's it's about to have its thirtieth anniversary. Um, and it's a lot of work. I mean, the work that Pete puts into keeping the website going, the work of doing, you know, our annual reports, uh, all this stuff. We've got Facebook, we've got Delphi. Do we still need the Northeast? And she said something so wise. She said, when people have met each other face to face, they treat each other entirely differently in the electronic world. It is more civil. It is a, it's a more uh, professional interaction. It's a more considered interaction. And so uh, the, the, the work that everybody who's starting to put fly-ins together um, is putting in these relationships we're creating, they actually, I, I have a, you know, a hope, and I don't know what y'all think, but this may be important, not just for our airplanes, but for, uh, for, for our world, so. There you go. Any comments? CJ, CJ, this is PJ again. I just wanted to request something of the group, what their thoughts are on it. Um, again, I'm kind of new to all of the convention, just the line in general, but I see a lot of guys put YouTube videos on certain things about their aircraft. And uh, my question to the entire group here is, would it make any sense, you know, if I were to change my tires or I recently I did all baffles, new baffles on my aircraft. And I did post a little video of what I did and how I did it, even though I'm not probably the best guy to do it. But there's a lot of professionals on this group. Would it make sense for the rest of the command to drivers if we were to post simple videos where it might give them a little bit more knowledge than what they already know, uh, especially someone like myself, perhaps. But I just wanted to kind of run that by you guys, even Matthew on his side, maybe does that make sense uh, along with the ADs and everything else he's putting together. So just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Uh, nowadays, we're all living in this high technology world. Those videos make a huge difference. I mean, there, there could be a lifesaver. So see what you guys think. I will tell you that absolutely that fits in with some of the stuff that we are trying to work on here. The Comanche Zoom library. Um, so there's a wonderful twin and driver and uh, CFWI MEI who does videography, who's been editing those and those will start to get uploaded to YouTube so that people can find the Comanche Zoom library. Uh, the short takes that we made out of the top 10 tips, that was a Les Thomas initiative. Those need to be uploaded to YouTube, but even in their current form, they are the most clicked on Comanche Zoom libraries ever, those short top 10 tips for new Comanche owners that got broken into 10 or 15 little videos. And so obviously, uh, just from looking at that, PJ, you're right on. We need those short videos. So yes, please. There is a, a Comanche Zoom channel or a Comanche Town channel. Um, and what we need to do is get you that information. So if it's all right with you, you can upload it into that channel and everybody can all find them in a, in a single place. Love it. Let's do it. That's great. Okay. Rich, you had a question? Yes. Uh, could I get uh, PJ's information since uh, I live in El Cajon and uh, uh, where you guys are flying into this weekend is about 55 miles north of me without having mine flying. I could drive up there, but uh, I had something else going. But do you have an email address or somewhere where we can contact you if you have a group that's getting together in the Southwest? Uh, def definitely, Rich. I can, um, um, let me see if I got to educate myself how to put my info on here, but if not, <laughs> I'll find a way with CJ and forward my email address to you. Uh, that yep. way you can get it. We are going to be there this Saturday, probably be around 11 o'clock. So we already made the arrangements with the restaurant. We would love to see you over there. That's fantastic. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I can get there because I have something to do in the morning and my plane is down. So uh, 
but I would like, uh, I was in the old Southwest group and uh, the last, it's been forever since we had anything like that. And about two months ago, a bunch of us on here got together and flew into uh, Lake Havasu. It happened in like about three days. And there was about 17 people that uh, said they were going to go. I hitched a ride with another guy. And by the time we got through parking planes and there, we had 36 airplanes from seven states. Uh, and the restaurant, we helped them out. Boy, did we help them out. <laughs> I think some of them were able to retire. But uh, I would like to get, if you have a group that's together in the Southwest here, uh, I would like to uh, be part of it. Yeah, Rich, I just sent you my email info. Uh, I'm going to send you my phone number. Um, you should be able to see it on your screen. Yes, uh, I see your email address, and I can just contact you by email. You can send me a phone number. Okay, I'll take it. And uh, so there we go. I'll be in touch. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for catching the typos on the website. I will get right on fixing those. The thought that counts. Um, it is 941. Um, Pete, do you want to quickly bring up any last questions for PJ on the fly-ins there? I think what's clear is that we should do a separate Comanche Zoom on the fly-ins emerging around the country. Would and, uh, and how to get connected with the group and the initiatives we're doing to try to make people able to find their, their uh, Comanche drivers around the world. Because the FAA registry shows that there's still, a, that in the US, the current, and now remember we went to three year registrations. So you can presume that most of these airplanes that are registered are flying conservatively 90%. Um, there are still about 3,500 Comanches between the uh, singles and the twins on the US website. And then um, Zach Grant and I did a little bit of back of the envelope calculating on what's in uh, Europe in England and uh, South America and Australia and South Africa. And, and we think there's still close to 4,000 of us flying. It's, uh, it's a good number, we're a market. So um, what we were gonna to try to do is uh, a quick website tour. And I just think we need to postpone the rest of this and just quickly overview what these topics are as a teaser for when we resume this, this uh, meeting. Is everybody up for a part two? You bet, yes. Okay, so in would, brief, uh, go ahead. That would be great. Okay, super. I'm gonna very briefly just discuss um, number and I do want to stop for how to support these projects uh, because if you are here in the zoom still and you've stuck with us this long if you could possibly see it in your heart the Comanche zooms actually cost a fair amount each year because we got big enough to need the infrastructure and so we started just paying for it with uh, you know various people if you can donate to support the infrastructure to support the Comanche zooms us volunteers are happy to, to volunteer the time um, but your donation will go towards either engineering projects to support the Comanche or um, to support the Comanche Zooms or to protect the company and our type. And to find out how to donate, there's a Venmo account. If you do Venmo, you can do the Venmo app from your phone. And that's at Northeast Comanche Tribe. Uh, when you do it, just put a note in your memo line that says what you want it spent on, whether it's the legal defense fund, because, because some people over the ICS sued the officers individually, but more importantly, like engineering projects for the Comanche, like the Tailhorn AD research that Hans Newbert mentioned earlier, uh, strut housing research that we're working on to make that part available so that the twins don't have such a scary situation. Um, and a lot of other projects like this, um, a marketplace so that all of the people who are innovating can just bring their products uh, forward. Um, Jeff Munford, I think was here tonight to talk about a very cool uh, AC unit that he's working on. And um, uh, PJ's been working on a, uh, a DC uh, AC 
air conditioning unit for your airplane. These are electric. You won't have to put ice in your airplane anymore. Um, new, uh, lots of things that will be available that are repeatable that you can order for your Comanche. And then the swap meet is for one-offs. If you've got a bird you're selling, a part you need that you're looking for, there's a form on the Northeast website. So Pete, if you want to bring up the landing page for the Northeast tribe, I'll just very briefly um, talk about that. So to, to um, if you want to make a donation, you can send a check. And what Pete was trying to show you earlier was, there it is. So if you just go to northeastcomanche.org and you click. So the tribe, um, tribe's office so, page. So Pete, over to you for a moment. This is, it's on the tribe officers page. If you go back to the, the no, I guess I can find it for sure. I got to go quick here. Uh, there we go. Nope. <laughs> if you just go to northeastcomanche.org. Well, yeah. It, it's actually it, you'll 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 uh, yeah, if you uh, if you want to just bring people into northeastcomanche.org, that's perfect because that's what most people are coming in via. That's it. Yep. And then if the the place I was showing you was on this tribe officer page. At the bottom of the page is where you can send a check. To go to Malcolm Dickinson. Uh, if you want to send it to me, you could. This is the the official address for the Northeast Comanche Tribe Incorporated, my home address. So you know, I can get things for him also. Yep. And the address changes, but Pete, as the the uh, secretary, has the corporate address. Um, and if somebody else got elected secretary, then that address would move. Um, but for now. You can either send a check to the treasurer or the secretary. You can make a contribution via Venmo to at Northeast Comanche Tribe. And then the PayPal link, if you want to just use a credit card, is right there at the bottom. And these are the very Sorry to, yeah. uh, sorry to sound like a, a PBS uh, yeah. pitch. The other thing is we've had inquiries um, from people who would like to become sponsors of the Comanche Zoom, similar to when you get to the end of a really cool show and they're like, hey, you sponsored by, um, you know, Joe's Cool Crab Shack or International Business Machines. So if you would like, if your company would like to be uh, featured as a sponsor of the Comanche Zooms, we would be delighted to, to have you become a sponsor. Um, and then beyond that, if you look at the northeastcomanche.org, uh, what we wanted to do is I get calls pretty regularly. Hey, where do I find the parse manual or the service manual? And, um, and or how do I find the Comanche Zoom recording? So if you go to northeastcomanche.org, um, you'll see this is the page that comes up. And right underneath that blue bar, you can find you can find all the Comanche Zoom recordings and future schedules and also, go ahead, click. Um, right at the top of that now, there's a new thing that's been added, which, or is about to be added, which is uh, how to actually join the Comanche Zooms. And so Pete is about to add a link so that you can just click here to join a, a current ongoing Comanche Zoom on Thursday night. And here's our next one. Uh, yeah, aircraft appraisal. Yep. And below that is the, the list of recordings for this year. And down here is the list of recordings for last year. And they're in reverse order. So the newest one is at the top. And Pete's working on a searchable index. So you'll be able to just come in and find what you're looking for. Um, but what, uh, and what will be here in the next day or two is if you look at where you can see at the top, there's like a table where it says, click here for 2021 Comanche Zoom recordings, click here for 2020 Comanche Zoom recordings, swap shop listing, et cetera. Right on the top of that, 
there'll be a click here to join Comanche Zoom. And that will just, if you're coming in from a browser, it'll just automatically launch it. So that'll be an easy, easy place to find that, how to join. Just go to northeastcomanche.org, click on Comanche Zoom's link, and then click that link and you'll be in the Zoom on Thursday nights. Um, you can see also um, the Comanche Doc Library. That's the quick link. So if you've forgotten docs.northeastcomanche.org or comanche.info, you can just click on that and you'll be in Matthew Smith's um, Comanche Doc Service Manual um, and uh, parts manuals and all the other amazing stuff that's in there. The fly in schedule is right there in the middle. And uh, that will get you, as we start to add fly-ins around the country, um, by default, this has the Northeast uh, schedule of everything from uh, New England down to West Virginia. And um, along with the major air shows and the major AOPA fly-ins. And going forward, that'll also have uh, the fly-ins happening all around. We're uh, still determining how to organize that and uh, but it'll be under fly-ins and I think at this point the rest of it um, that index is coming oh any form links on the right hand side there that's actually important that's where you're going to be able to go to to uh, register for Comanche Town whether it's at Oshkosh or Sun and Fun or some of the Europeans are thinking we should be able to do Comanche Town once those uh, uh, great air shows in, in Europe start to become live again. So we're going to support them making that happen and hopefully go and, and, uh, and meet y'all. And I think the rest of it, we're just going to leave for you. Um, under disclaimer, and Pete, if you could point out one other thing, sometimes we make mistakes or bad or incomplete information gets into a Comanche Zoom. And I actually called the FAA about this and said, hey, what do we do when we put out wrong information or incomplete information? <laughs> like, should we just fall on our swords and commit harikari? Or could we just invite people to correct it and keep an errata file? So as you can see, under the disclaimer, um, there's this disclaimer, but in addition, Pete has a place where you can, Pete, where is the thing where we can submit errata and where the, the updated files of errata information is? We don't have an updated file yet, but if you want a feedback, right here. Yep. So in any form link, if you come into a Comanche Zoom and we've made a mistake or somebody's made a mistake or you have a question or concern, um, put it in here it's confidential and then if you're you know and then and we'll check the information you give us and then we'll either attribute it to you or if you'd prefer to keep it anonymous but what we want to do is we want to make sure that there's a way for people to say that information's wrong or incomplete or there's another way to do it and so share your knowledge and and fix our errors <laughs> and we try not to make them but but they do happen and our presenters try not to make them but they happen we also set it up so that you can send your information to a particular person. All of these can be checked. You can you can go to a multiple people if you need to. So you can send it where you want. And that's it. And if you have suggestions for Zooms or uh, want to tell us to go jump in the lake or you want to run for a position or volunteer or create a new one, uh, we are completely driven by what people ask us to do. And we hope the Northeast will will always be that way, whoever it is that's making it happen and whatever name it comes to have in the future. Go ahead, Rich. Uh, here's a picture. Let me, let me get it centered here. Uh, of our San Diego Jaguar Club uh, badge. And they weren't all that expensive and they're made in Tucson. I'll have to dig up a piece of paper that finds out how much they cost. The logo there is a fairly exotic logo. I don't know whether that's uh, uh, done by the San Diego Jag Club or not, but there it is. Nice and so classy. It. Yes, it is. It is quite well. It's a Jaguar. They don't run. They're you know the electrical system is Lucas Prince of Darkness, so they ought to have something that works well. There you go. 
<laughs> Rich, this I is great. I have four. I have five of them. <laughs> oh, well. So, anyway. so your um, name tags and Michael's name tags um, are awesome because it gives us two potential options. And so you've got my cell phone, right? Yes. So I'm one of the Comanche Town co-hosts. Um, if you, if it's easy for you to do it this way, just uh, find out uh, how much is, and assume we would be ordering 50 of them at this point. I think that's fair. Okay. But well, let me out take if we could do a group buy. Yeah. It'll take me uh, about another week. We've got a, a Jaguar drive. If we can get enough cars running, mine's down. My plane is down. The other Jaguars got a uh, air conditioning problem and it was 92 here today in Southern Cal. So anyway, but uh, I think we'll go in the uh, excursion or the blazer <laughs> so just for the heck of it. But anyway, uh, so I'll check with the people and I'll find out uh, uh, more about these. They're really nice. So they are. Anyway. That is a classy. That's a beautiful badge. Yeah. I, I have uh, to say I will take I will take I will take a picture of it with the phone and I will text it to you because I have your number. Perfect. Thank you okay. so much. And yeah, if you can find out if we can get them and how much. Yeah. Uh, all right. I am um, on the marketplace uh, and the uh, swap meet in short swap meets for one time stuff. There's a form under any form links, anything you want, need or have that's sitting around in a spare. If you fill out that form, your part that you need, your request for help will go out to the community to 4,000 people as well as be on the website. And if, you, uh, and if you have something that's sitting around your hangar that you think somebody else might benefit from, whether it's free or you want money for it, go ahead and put it in there and it'll, uh, it'll go out on that Comanche Zoom invite at the bottom. So every time you get that Comanche Zoom invite, if you scroll way down to the bottom, there's this big long list of airplanes for sale, parts wanted, parts for sale. Feel free to join in. Um, I am, unless people have questions uh, under that marketplace, that's some of the things that are either there now that you can get on the Northeast Tribe website. Um, Hans's DVD, which is the thousand hour landing gear DVD, the instructions on how to do that is being sold at cost. So it's $20 plus shipping and handling to wherever you are. And uh, Hans wanted to make sure that information was available to everybody. Um, and the other things on that list are either there or coming. And with that, I am going to just stop, ask if anybody has questions or comments and say, we'll uh, continue this in a part two. And this I'm going to read. For everybody who's made it this far, this was something Zach Grant posted in the wee hours of this morning for sale. PA 28260C, 10 cents major, new everything else, firewall forward. New MT Prop, Garmin G500 TXI, STEC 3100 Autopilot, fresh thousand hour gear inspection, no damage history, new paint, new interior, comes with hanger home and powered tow bar, floats, class A RV, 8,000 gallon fuel farm, 10 cases of bush light, two tickets to the next Bristol NASCAR race, a freezer full of Omaha steaks, 20,000 or best reasonable offer. And if you've read this far, you need to be told, April Fools. Oh, Add me there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. That's it. That's all we've got to say for tonight. Anybody want to add or suggest? I think about this point, I'm going to uh, end the uh, recording. You can all look at it. Uh, it will be available tomorrow towards the middle of the day uh, on the website because uh, I can do it quickly up here in New Hampshire. And uh, I will be back next week to do some more. So uh, with that, at the end, I'm going to end the recording. Just a